Welcome to Speaking of Strong Style, where we discuss the news, issues, and events surrounding New Japan Pro Wrestling. I'm Stephen Conway. With me, of course, is Jeremy Feinstone. We're contributors to the Fight Game Media, and we are celebrating our 100th episode of Speaking of Strong Style. We did this 100 times? We've probably done it more than 100 times. I don't know if we counted every show, but man, we've been pretty consistent. It we has started been out consistent. thinking like two weeks, every two weeks we can do a show. And we're like, nah, I don't think that's going to work out uh, after the capital collision in, uh, in May of 2022. And dang, here we are. Yeah, we here we it. are. And of course, that counts both our uh, live YouTube shows, our podcasts. We've had a couple of different iterations over that 100 episodes there mm-hmm. where we were doing some different things here. But we've we've been in this rhythm for a good while here. The the live this YouTube what I call show and then a podcast. It's, it's felt really good. <laughs> This is what I call a groove, my man. There Our go. groove is good. So since we last talked, now Sakura Genesis is going to be uh, one of our key topics today, of course. We're going to be discussing that. We're going to be talking about Windy City Riot coming up tomorrow. Uh, we have another live show going on after Riot that uh, we're going to be doing to review it. There's uh, Best of the Super Junior lineup. We have uh, Wrestling World in Taiwan. Lot, plenty going on. We're also going to talk about the passing of Ake Bono. And uh, get into that a little bit today. But Genesis feels like it was a really long time ago right now, Jeremy, even though, I mean, it was five days, which is a long time in terms of this show, jumping from episode to episode. But in the meantime, also getting WrestleMania in there, all the Mm -hmm. stuff with Stardom, Supercard of Honor, I'm going to leave some stuff out, Bloodsport, uh, GCW. It's hidden video cameras. The busiest week, yeah, boy. Uh, the busiest weekend of uh, the year for pro wrestling. And just what were your overall thoughts? Are you uh, when I when we got to Tuesday and we had done mm-hmm. the raw after? I actually took almost a full day off of wrestling. I barely watched anything at all on Tuesday. I did see a little bit, but I was uh, I was tired. But man, uh, there was a lot of great stuff. So I had a little bit of a of a different experience. Uh... Monday morning, I ended up having a doing a WrestleMania review with Mike Gilbert. And then Monday night, I did a very personal show with uh, Paul Fontaine on the joy of wrestling, mm-hmm. going into like depression in the 2010s after some personal stuff went down mm-hmm. and a uh, friend helping me get through that and uh, how the joy of wrestling kind of got me through uh, the dark times. So when you asked me how Tuesday was, there was a little bit of an emotional come down from all of that. Because there was uh, some stuff. But the wrestling itself, man, uh, good weekend to be a wrestling fan. I wouldn't mm-hmm. say so much going after into the later on in the week. But for a little while there, I was riding a high of, of, of good wrestling vibes across the board. It was a big weekend in a lot of ways for a lot of people. I mean, the, the stardom wrestlers, you know, it's Bushy Road adjacent here. The stardom wrestlers were everywhere. Mm-hmm. Uh, there was a lot of uh, cool thing. There were a lot of th- cool things going on with them across multiple different promotions. Uh, WrestleMania, I thought, especially night two, was fantastic. Uh, certainly one of the best endings they've ever done in the 40 WrestleManias. I've watched every single one of them over the years. And uh, it's it was uh, quite an emotional uh, weekend end to that one. And uh, Genesis, there were a couple of matches there that really delivered some good stuff that we're going to talk about, too. Mm-hmm. So there is uh, a lot there. And thankfully, we have a little bit of help, too, uh, to yes. discuss all this, because there's a lot going on. We got we got our homeboy, Jeff <laughs> Nipper, Professor Puro, mm-hmm. a Noah extraordinaire, a man who writes everything down with Fumi Saito. And he's here to join <laughs> us right now. We're going to add him. That's uh, fantastic. Hello, sir. Justin, very, guys, very glad to have you. Very glad to have you. Uh, r- write this down with Fumi Saito. Me as... I have a weird connection. I'm sorry. Mm, it's it's you've sounded better. It's it's a little it's a little it's a little crackly. So far, so good. We're gonna we're gonna make this work. Okay. How are you? I can't really hear you guys. I'm gonna I'm gonna hop in and out real quick. So one sure, second. that sounds great. We're we're gonna get back to what we're doing, but we miss you, and we'll see you soon. Yeah, there you go. All right. So we'll get those technical difficulties uh, ironed out over here, the wonders of the internet. But uh, yeah, at Justin, by the way, uh, co-host, like you said, write this down with Fumi mm-hmm. Saito, one of my absolute favorite uh, history podcasts and YouTube shows. Uh, that's one where you can really learn a lot about the history of New Japan and how it's woven through the history of pro wrestling uh, in Japan altogether. And of course, uh, it's it's intricately uh, woven in, uh, Inoki being a star from JWA, but he also covers all Japan, Noah, 
uh, all that and just the history of it there. Fascinating stories. It's a really well done uh, show. And Justin hosts that with Fumi. So very excited to have him on. Of course, also has uh, has been a member of the NOAA broadcast team in English. So uh, as far as someone who can help us with a company that New Japan has and is continuing to work very closely with, uh, Justin's a real valuable resource, Jeremy, especially because we have a NOAA presence in Best of the Super Juniors. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the guys is on excursion over there in Noah. Mm -hmm. So uh, as soon as we get Justin up and running here, uh, we will talk to him about all of that. Yeah, I'm not worried about that. He's definitely going to have a little bit of insight on things that I'm sure more than a few people uh, checking us out will have questions about. Uh, so I had a fun time watching Sakura Genesis. What ended up happening is I watched WrestleMania with, uh, with Dave Meltzer. Mm -hmm. And when I got over there, I was like, hey, have you seen any of Sakura Genesis? And he's like, no, I haven't. I was like, do you want to watch it after WrestleMania? And he's like, yeah, that would be great. So I brought him over a chicken sandwich. I actually brought him two chicken sandwiches from down the street. Because I figured it might be a long night. Who knows how much, <laughs> like, he's getting out to the grocery store on this Saturday. Yeah, uh, we do this. We do the whole deal. And uh, he's like, what have you seen and where should we start? I'm like, honestly, you need to start with the tornado tag if we're starting not at the beginning of the show. So we started with that one and uh, he was a, in agreement that that was a great match to start with. And uh, yeah. we ended up watching the show and I got there about 3.30 on, a, on the West Coast and I got back in my own front door about midnight that night. Oh, so okay. here's a little bit of a photographic evidence here, right, as so you can see. So for we the got, podcast, uh, folks, we have Dave here on his, uh, with his dog. This is Espresso. You see, and it's a very popular <laughs> meme dog. And then okay. this is my perspective at the show. <laughs> oh, there you have it. All right. So uh, Espresso was right up in your uh, right up in your grill there, it looks like. Espresso is very much a fan of mine and not a fan of everybody else's. So uh, that he's part of the, the gatekeeping group of uh, critters that, that keep me allowed in. So... Oh, okay. Now that I've managed to distract enough with that one, let's bring Justin back on and see how this goes. Sorry about that, guys. Yeah, Espresso hates me. You remember yes, that, Jeremy? I what do. The That's the one time we hung out in person was oh, oh, over at that house. We had the discussion about the white at boots. Days, yeah. The white <laughs> boots. And I remember it was hard to get food late at night around that area. Yes. There were, we had an issue. It was COVID time. It was COVID time. And... So there was limitations and, and all that stuff. So it was an interesting time. But I'm not sure how many people want to know about the uh, inner workings of Dave Melker's house. Actually, I bet a lot of people do, but that's not what we're here for. Yeah, it's funny. I, I was back here in Austin. I was watching. Now, we had uh, we had WrestleMania here. I was actually at the Austin FC soccer game on uh, Saturday night when the first night happened. So I caught it all very late. I had mm -hmm. to get a cup of coffee uh, at about midnight there, and I watched it from – midnight to three in the morning, which you can do because if you just fast forward through some of these entrances, you can get that show pared down to about two hours and 45 minutes. Sure. So that helped me quite a bit. Uh, Austin, by the way, it come from behind basically a buzzer beater winner uh, as a goal there at the, the last, one of the last kicks of the game. So very exciting finish there. And then I got to see the first night of WrestleMania. And then we were in the, as we discussed last week, the ominously named path of totality for the, uh, the eclipse on Monday. And so uh, I had that uh, weird experience uh, after, after watching Mania on Sunday and being up late again, get up and then it goes completely dark at one 30 in the afternoon, which is a very surreal experience to, to be, th to live through. So not everybody gets to see something like that, Jeremy. It was, it was very odd I mean, that we, we watched the sun go across the, or the moon go across the sun. I tried there. to see it on the West coast, got nothing. There it was, was nothing to it. It got flat out dark it was freaky <laughs> like I, I we were talking about this with my friends were like it, it you know the, it goes through and that's the street lights come on and everybody's uh house lights that are sensitive to the dusk and all that all those pop on for a few minutes and all that we're like you know if you didn't know anything about science if you want to go back to like ancient man and humans mm -hmm. and all that kind of stuff and you didn't know anything about science this would freak you the hell out like i understand all the stuff about you know You'd like just be all waiting the things until about the next nightmare scenario that just happens yeah, right? it's like, <laughs> like i understand why people used to freak out about this there's no excuses now by the way for all the people that thought the world was ending no excuses now but back then i can get it as to why people would be panicked about this you're just like holy crap i mean it's it's a, it's a very odd experience but i'm glad i had it. so we got a lot of stuff to cover right now 
Yeah. But. We need to get a bunch of plugs out of the way real quick before we can get underway because we do have Windy City coming up and we want to show that we have our own show tomorrow night doing a post show with Josh from We Work Stiff. Yeah. And then if you are able and in the area and if keeping it strong style, just reposted that we are live right now, which thank you guys. They have an informable fan meetup on uh, before Windy City tomorrow night, 4 p.m. to 6 p.m. on the 22nd floor of the Hilton Garden Inn, Chicago McCormick Place. They'll be hanging out there. All are welcome. If you choose to DM them ahead of time, they will be open to it. And let's see. Do we have the, uh, the little advertiser? There we go. That's a, nice a, that's a nice hotel, by the way. You should If you can get there, you should go. That's a nice place. Dude. They, uh, they look like they're making a lot of effort to get a reach out going, and I applaud them uh, completely for that. And, uh, yeah, so I just wanted to throw them out there. We will have uh, the WeWork Stiff, Josh DeVee, the host of that, joining us live from Australia uh, tomorrow for the show, and I am super excited for that. Uh, I, I really just appreciate all the coordination between all the podcast partners uh, covering yeah. Japan. I appreciate that we're all working together doing our own thing rather than like trying to undercut each other. And yeah. it's just, they're all very, very good people. And I cannot say enough good things about them. Yeah. All right, it's Justin. Hi. <laughs> yes. That How sounds fun. You? Uh, yeah. Are you in LA right now? Yes. I am. Okay. So how has Noah been going? We had a couple of questions while you were out of the way. Um, Ninja Mac is now member is now going to be best to the Super Junior, so that is first thing. In your opinion, is he probably the best candidate from Noah to be coming over for uh, that show? The best candidate? Uh, not necessarily. He's a great candidate. Ninja Mac is an oddity. Not an oddity. He's a uh, what's the word? Anomaly. Because okay. you put him in the New Japan uh, Junior set you put him with noah uh gcw wherever he's he's so ninja mac that <laughs> you kind of have to adapt to what he's doing he's really he there was a, a big card last night at cork and hall and he he busted out a perfect shooting star press which is not as ninja e as you'd expect it's more pro wrestler -y, and he could do that too i He's going to have some very, very interesting, unique, distinct matches uh, in the best of the Super Juniors. Also, Hayata. Hayata, as of a couple hours mm -hmm. ago, the new GHC national champion. There you Spoiler go. Spoiler alert. Sorry. Is, <laughs> now, and Ninja Mac is also the hardcore. Means, controversial means, but... oh, I'm sorry. I was going to say Ninja Mac's the hardcore champion, too, isn't he? That is true. The white, the old white belt is back. He's the hardcore champion. Although uh, on Monday Magic this week, Alpha Wolf physically stole his belt and was wearing it around his waist last night. There's so a lot of there's that going a around. Of, uh, what is up with that? Possession of nine yeah. tenths of the law seems to be a logic everyone subscribes to. <laughs> he stole his belt and then he says, "This is my belt." And Ninja Max says, "No, that's my belt." It's, yeah, that's that's not much more to it than that. <laughs> so, uh, but, uh, but I believe both both Hayata and Ninja Mac will be entering the best of Super Juniors with GHC Gold around the waist. Absolutely. And, you, and then uh, we also saw Kato Kiyomiya and uh, Ryohei Oiwo recently won the uh, tag team tournament over there in NOAA. Now that's that's a that is a big deal. Unfortunately, they weren't able to make the title match. Apparently, it's Kiyomiya that has the injury. Correct. And they weren't able to to wrestle, uh, you know, uh, Jack Morris and Anthony Green, I think, for the the titles. Uh, although they did earn the the shot, so maybe that'll come down the road. But uh, for for New Japan fans, Justin uh, Ryohei Oiwa, of course, in a, kind of a new concept for Young Lions, is on his excursion, basically next door, so to speak, over in Noah. Uh, he's won the tag team tournament, so he must be doing fairly well. What's your what's been your impression of Ryohei Oiwa and his excursion to Noah? Oiwa is. Freaking awesome. And to be honest and to be selfish, I wouldn't mind if he just stayed at Noah because he's <laughs> he's thriving. He's, he he feels he's starting to really feel like he's not an excursion guy and he's a part of the mix. 
Mm -hmm. uh, he had a great singles match on Monday Magic against Kano this week. Uh, like you said, Steve, the Victory Challenge Tag League, they won that. Uh, Kiyomi had a, a minor concussion, a spinal bruising, spinal, you know. Oof. Mm -hmm. But he, he's okay, and he, he wrestled an amazing match last night, and they actually got that shot. Uh, he and Oiwa, they had that shot against uh, GLG this past weekend. I believe it was in oh. Osaka. Oh, pardon me. Okay. I didn't so, so, I got a question for you about him. What are you feeding him at that dojo? Because he's getting so freaking <laughs> huge. Who's that, Oiwa? Yeah. He's probably... He uh, each again, uh, protein that no sponsors. That's probably what he's having. I man, it's just packing all in the mass. Every time I see him, I'm like, can you pack on anymore? And apparently he can. <laughs> I thought it was really fun to watch. I think it was about a week. It was uh, the, the last the March 31st Corican Hall show. Not the recent Star Navigation, but the one right before. There was an amazing, absolutely fantastic match between... Keno and a new rookie named Yu Owada versus Oiwa and Kiyomiya. And Oiwa and Owada are about the same age. They're younger guys. They're like 23, 24. But what you're saying, Jeremy, the, the size difference, what, Owada is pretty, you know, he's good looking guy, lean mm -hmm. kid. I would say normal for a pro wrestler at that age. But uh, being the same age, Oiwa is maybe tw like two times the size of this kid. Even though they're both kids, technically. So, right. yeah, the, he, he's a big, big kid, and he's fast. He's getting and, bigger, uh, man. He's just, that's yeah. the formula for success. If you're just going to get bigger and you can just move at the same level, you're going you're to go places. Was, his T-shirt was one of the top sellers at the NOAA, like the NOAA domestic store recently. Do you uh, – go ahead, Stephen. No, I, I was just going to ask Justin here a little bit about – We've talked about how OE was over there on his excursion, and there we have representation best of the Super Juniors. It, there has been a close relationship with NOAA and New Japan over the last couple of years, and I was wondering from you, just from the NOAA perspective, what is your what are your feelings, your thoughts on how this is? I know this is a very open ended question about how this thing is going. I know some NOAA fans were a little put off by some of the results that you know New Japan wrestlers when they did meet NOAA wrestlers kind of but. It was kind of heavy on the New Japan side as far as the wins go and losses go. Have from the NOAA end of it, do you feel like this working alliance, so to speak, has been uh, good for NOAA, bad for NOAA? What or just you know, has, has everyone been helping each other out? What's the thought from that side of the aisle on it? Well, I mean, there's like two ways you could think about it. You could think about it like the K Fabe, like you know, uh, wins and losses, and, and that storyline kind of thing there's that way to think about it and then there's the, the reality of it the business of it and the business of it is you know there's a good relationship between new japan and noah especially through abima because mm -hmm. abima the channel which is the channel that cyberfight shows their product on is also it's owned by tv asahi which is new japan's you know parent company so we, the we have that United Japan Pro Wrestling banner that we just sure, yeah. established. There, there is a, like a constant. It, it's not like it is in states, I guess, uh, where it's like taboo or, or a big deal to like work alongside other companies. It's pretty. It's always it been not just Noah, just in Japan, like open ended. Like, hey, we're doing some business, and it's it's not thought of as anything much more than that. Uh, the business, the, the reality is New Japan, especially over the past, well, since 2012, 2013, has been unquestionably the biggest company, pro wrestling company in Japan. Uh, so it's just Noah, since I guess around the pandemic era, when Cyber Agent got involved, you know, it became, it's, a, it's a rebuilding process. And from there, we also have to factor in the COVID couple of years of covid um noah's kind of in a rebuilding stage and it's honestly domestically it's hotter than it's ever been in like 20 years 18 20 years yeah. that's it within the country of japan uh i think 
the relationship or whatever it is, it's, it's win-win for everybody. If the fans aren't uh, happy with the, the creative aspect of it, that's one end of it. But what it's doing for Noah is it's raising Noah's uh, name and the, the awareness of Noah's fighters because simply there just aren't enough eyes on it compared with New Japan and other companies. I, but, I uh, agree. I think it's been very helpful, and I love having the Noah guys come over because there's a ton of talent in that company. So when they do come over, it's usually something that adds to the show, adds a little variety, some fresh faces, and I, I've been very happy with it, and I'm glad that that's the case in the other direction too because I, I'm always happy when I see guys go over there. It's really been, and you have a, a history show with Fumi Saito, it's really been since Baba versus Anoki, New Japan, All Japan, since that – no one worked with each other, you know, and even then they would work with other companies, just not each other. So that, mm -hmm. that spirit of cooperation is very different now. It was mostly just Bob and Anoki that didn't want to touch each other. But, uh, you know, it, it, I think it has been helpful. And then we're seeing this all together thing, this uh, this company becoming a trade group, basically, that also can do some things for charity and good PR work like they're doing with the all together shows. And, and again, no one and New Japan are two of the biggest uh, parts of that. So it's it, I, it feels very healthy for everybody. Yeah, I mean, the, the, of course, there's always going to be uh, online discussions amongst fans about the creative aspects and uh, pe thinking certain people or, or wrestlers or companies look better than the other. I mean, you, you could we could sit here and argue it, uh, for hours, but in the end, it's it's a business and it's about raising awareness from my end, talking about it from Noah's perspective, getting more eyeballs on Noah and for new Japan, it's always nice to spice things up, especially these days. I mean, well, why the hell not? You know, I mean, who does, who's going to say no to another Masaki to me, Tomohiro Ishii match, right? <laughs> we were, I was just about to go there. I've called them separated at birth. Like I, somehow these two were born twins. I know they're not the same age. Don't ask for the science on this, but I feel like they were separated at birth in the hospital. These two were basically created to go together. And we're going to see a little bit of that at, uh, coming up again. Uh, anytime that they want to wrestle each other, I'm there for it. Uh, Jeremy, do you have anything else? I had one more for Justin. If you don't, I, Julia showed up. That was the one I had. <laughs> okay. So we wanted to ask you about this. Your your thoughts on that and and is it going where do you think it's going that Julia is showing up suddenly uh after her well she her last show with uh, Stardom is uh, coming up this weekend but after her contract was up, poof, that's uh, she she turns up on the on the green stage. Monday magic out of nowhere. Yeah, that was a surprise for everyone, the mysterious Julia. I have uh I I I know as much as you guys do on that one. I mean, she has a lot more going on than just the appearance on uh, Monday Magic. And when she'll, she'll be showing up on the uh, Wrestle Magic pay per view, which I believe it's May 4th, which is a day or two before all together. So she'll be on that. What is going to happen? I don't know. I mean, this, she's kind of, I suppose, an un unprecedented situation where she's kind of, she's got her hands in a couple different bowls all at once already and i think a lot of this and a lot of her future will have to do with whatever rossi ogawa will announce or has planned for this year with his company and or whatever plans he has uh going for him i think we'll know a lot more once we know that aspect mm -hmm. but uh it seems like she'll have a unique path like it's, it's not I, I can't really compare her to many uh like peers or people who have done something similar it, it you know what like it felt she's like punching her own ticket you know you watched it it feels like yeah. she's punching her own ticket if you watched monday magic last week it was like uh she was the first one of the first segments on within the first five minutes felt like lex luger in minnesota on the first nitro right <laughs> yeah it was just incongruous just to say that one plus i mean no it doesn't have a women's division so you're like okay what are you doing here exactly uh but i mean there have been special events yeah. before so yeah the women's division is there's some i wouldn't say there is a women's division but there are regulars i, mm. I would say i think miyuki takase has been in a number pretty much almost, Almost every women's match that has been hosted. Uh, Nagi Nozaki has been a regular. Great Sakya, Great Muta's maniac daughter. And uh, <laughs> yeah, we'll see. I, I don't know if Rossi Ogawa's thing will be entirely separate. And Noah's thing will be just continue to host special matches. Or will it be more of a division? I'm not sure. It's still being developed. So 
But uh, I, I feel like within the next couple months, there'll be more substantial announcements so we can talk more about it. All right. Well, we'll take a look at that as it comes up. So uh, should we uh, go right into Sakura Genesis, guys? Is there anything else we want to add about this relationship? Because there's uh, we got some news, like I said, about uh, the best of the Super Juniors and some Noah presence there. So uh, anything else we want to get out of the way before we dive into that show? I got nothing. Uh, Justin, we are going into a barrage of stuff that we've seen and stuff we're going to talk about. You are welcome to stay with us or bounce out at any point, given what your schedule is like today. So please join along as long as you like. Well, unfortunately, I have not watched Soccer Genesis yet, but mm-hmm. um, I'd love to listen to you guys. But I'm going to have to say sayonara for now. Thank and you, sir. Thank you for having me on for the hunting show. Congratulations. You. Give thank your you. plugs out. Everything another... you got. Everything that you want to you want talk about. Your music. Uh, everything I got. Okay. Uh, Pro Wrestling Noah, last night's show, Star Navigation, Kiyomiya versus Kano grudge match was outstanding. Go watch it on Wrestle Universe. It's awesome. Um, write that down with Fumi Saito. Podcast I do with Fumi Saito. We don't have a set schedule. We try to put out a couple episodes a week, so check our YouTube. Uh, for that, this week's episode is talking about Haku or Meng or Fukunoshima. Uh, yeah, lots of good stuff. And we'll have a Q&A episode coming up soon and all kinds of exciting, cool things on the horizon. And uh, I can't think of anything else at the moment, but lots of cool things coming up. So That yeah. that show you do with Fumi, I, I say it all the time on here. I reference it a lot. Jeremy knows. I, I mention it all the time. It, it's just uh, it's one of my favorite wrestling history shows books magazines of any any kind of media uh the the depth of knowledge that fumi has your understanding of all of that and how uh pro wrestling uh works uh, it's uh very helpful to anyone who wants to better understand uh the art of japanese pro wrestling and how it relates to american pro wrestling it's it's that shows unique in that you don't get perspectives like that anywhere else and I, I just want to say thank you very much for doing it because i always get something out of it and i listen to every single one the only other thing i gotta say is right, thanks. the only thing i gotta say justin is if it was not for your patience with me when we were doing the blogs and the wordpress starting out on fight game media we would not be doing 100 episodes now so i very much appreciate <laughs> All the guidance you gave me, getting stuff out of the way and learning. And uh, I have not forgotten. So thank you very much, my friend. No, I'm, I'm very proud of everything we did with Fight Game. I'm, I'm sad about the, the WordPress not being up anymore. We had, There's a lot of great stuff on there. Yeah. So it's all the foundation. It's, 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 I, it's fun I, working I, with I, you, man. I had a great time. So you will, yeah, in fact, not be a stranger. Here. You'll be back in the future. And uh, we are yeah. going to move on with the show, and we will see you soon, my friend. Okay, and enjoy the show tomorrow when you see the riot. It should be good. Yeah, I think it's Thanks, good. Just... I think we're all going to have a good time with that one. Yeah. Thank all you right. very much, Justin. Have fun, guys. Congratulations. Thank Talk you. Thank you, bud. So, yeah, Justin Nepper there, a uh, big help to all of us in, in a lot of ways. And uh, somebody that we hope to have on uh, in the future as uh, New Japan and Noah continue to work together. I mean, he's the perfect guy to bring on when we do these cross-promotion shows, maybe when we have uh, some of those guys uh, on uh, on New Japan programming and things like that. He, he just uh, a great resource. So much obliged to him. And uh, thanks. And we've gotten some uh, congratulations. Colin, thank you so much. A USVA guy, thank you. Uh, Scott Edwards is here. Uh, the great uh, Scott Edwards, uh, the Joshi uh, genius, is here to, to say the congratulations. We really appreciate that. Thank, thanks, yeah. guys. Uh, it's, All the uh, support it's... has uh, has motivated us when there have been days where it's just a little hard to get the show up and going. <laughs> well, USVA guy, he's uh, he's working. So they're setting up the press yeah. conference right now. Might be dipping in and out. Well, I hope that press conference goes great. I mean, it should be uh, pretty exciting. So, it just uh, so yeah. happened we couldn't get any like reach out guests because they were all getting busy for the press, in the press conference yeah going right. on at our 100th episode so <laughs> yeah you know, yeah we'll be shooting so. we'll be shooting our shots with people later on we've done it before we'll do it again it, it works out jeremy's good at getting folks to to come on the show there so all right so I'm let's take at all. let's let's take a look at the Sakura genesis show and we're going to get through it here now of course this is five days ago so a lot of this stuff's old news we're not going to break it down uh There's by a lot uh, of rear window stuff on this one where it's like should you watch a match? Yes or no? This is why it's ideal to have the match by match. 
uh, watching well, viewing party. <laughs> we will begin with the good news, and that is that it was at uh, Rio Goku Kukujikan Sumo Hall. Attendance was 6,632. That is the most since last year's G1 finals, which was headlined by Kazuchika Okada against Tetsuya Naito for the G1 championship. It's about what last year's Sakura Genesis did. About six, That one did 6,500. This one just over 66. Altogether again, did about 6,500. The G1 semis last year did about 6,500. Uh, so that is a solid crowd. And you really have to go all the way back to 2019 for a, a larger crowd than the G1 finals or this Sakura Genesis show. So uh, this was a success as far as business goes, a strong crowd and a crowd that was into things. And I also thought, Jeremy, just from a, a aesthetic standpoint, it looked different. They did not set up the bleachers this time in Sumo Hall. So when you watch Sumo Hall, it's usually a pretty tight quarters type of show because of course it's it's made for sumo wrestling and that so they have the bleachers come right up to it and, and you, you sit on the floor they don't have chairs you know you, you sit on the mats and things well i took the mats away because i kept throwing them in the ring but the uh the uh but you have little suites of, of four you sit you sit kind of cross-legged with four people and all that with those bleachers and it it makes the the entrance tunnel very tight and it makes the ringside area feel like had the crowds right on top of you, which is good and bad. But here they they did not put the bleachers in. All the seats were on the floor, were just in the folding chairs, and it allowed them a larger entrance, a little bit more elaborate entrance. They still got a good crowd in there, so it just looked different than most sumo hall shows. Sumo hall was one of those I buildings like it when where they shake the cup like that. You don't need to tell me when a show is in sumo hall. Usually, I just have to kind of look at it. It's like the old Madison Square Garden. You can see where the tunnel. Oh, that's MSG. And Sumo was like that, but this looked different. I thought it was cool. If you're told a bit of a girl world where you look at it and you're like, hmm. oh, yeah. it's the same place. They moved a little bit of stuff around. <laughs> yeah, but, you know, and it allowed them to have an actual, like, an entrance tunnel, you know. So if you want to do the... You uh, architecture the, nerd, you. I am a venue nerd and a half. That's, you just have to deal with that when you do this show. So uh, we began, though, with a uh, pre-show Frontier Zone six-man tag. And this is... Uh, Toru Yano, Tomohiro Ishii, and Bolton Oleg uh, against Ayato Yoshida, uh, Chicharito Shoki, and Takuro Niki. Now, these guys are from the 2AW department. We got some more information on that. Uh, this is uh, 2AW and Just Tap Out, Takamichi Noku's group, mm -hmm. basically all came from the old Kaintai Dojo, and there was a split. So some people, including Taka, went with Just Tap Out. Other people went with 2AW. Here you are. And we had seen Ayato Yoshida before, back in when we talked about it, when Kai Entai Dojo used to send Young Lions to wrestle sometimes for New Japan. So that was one guy who had been uh, out there before, just been a few years. And uh, Bolton got the win on Shoki here. Uh, I thought these guys actually looked better and more confident than some of the other Frontier Zone teams we've seen in the past. I, I like what I saw there, although it was fairly quick. Uh, Oleg hit the Fireman's Carry Somersault, the Kamikaze, as they're calling it, uh, for the win. And uh, I also like their attitude and post-match comments. They were a little bit like, you know, you expect us to say thank you for bringing us here. Well, the hell with that. We want to beat you guys, and we think we're just as good as anybody you got. I like the attitude. So overall, Act actual pro wrestling in this. <laughs> very basic, very thumb, but, but overall, thumbs up. Yeah, I don't have anything to add other than uh, there is a little bit of the wheel just keeps spinning with Bolton Oleg matches. Like, they are putting over the same things that he does over and over and over again. And so if you're looking at it like, am I going to see anything different with Bolton Oleg in the near future? Probably not. This is probably what it's going to be until uh, we, we move on with the next iteration of his evolution. So the first main match on the card was uh, they had... TMDK, Kosei Fujita and Zack Sabre Jr. against El Desperado and Ryusuke Taguchi. Uh, this was good. Uh, everyone was on, I thought. It was well executed. Fujita beat Taguchi with an O'Connor roll. Uh, and this is all part of establishing Fujita for two things, the best of the Super Juniors and an angle that was going to be coming up later in the show. There were handshakes both before and after with Desperado and Zach from their Suzuki Goon days showing they still liked each other. And we also found out in backstage comments that Fujita recently had a procedure done on his nose. He had gotten a little bit of an injury there, so he had some uh, sinus surgery done, uh, and he is back uh, 100%. But again, this was uh, mostly to just get over Fujita, who I think is going to have – I don't think he's going to win Best of Super Juniors. I'll have a campaign. Uh, 
but I don't think he's going to, I don't think he's going to lose as many as he has. And, you know, I don't think he's going to get a young lion score line. I think he's, yeah, he's moving up in the world. You know what I, uh, I really like this match for with the chain wrestling between Desperado and uh, Zach Saber Jr. Yeah. Uh, I thought, I thought it was brief, but I thought Desperado brought something to a Zach Saber Jr. style confrontation that, not a lot of people come away still feeling like their own guy. You're, but you end up being in like a Zach Sabre Jr. scenario. I didn't feel that way when I was watching. I felt like Desperado was wrestling Zach Sabre Jr., not Desperado was getting handled by Zach Sabre Jr. Hmm, there you go. After that, we had a tag team match with Lij. We had Bushi and Hiromu Takahashi against uh, the War Dogs. That's David Finlay and Ghetto. That was the the team here. A bit of a surprise uh, finish to me here, considering who was in it. But they uh, decided to put Bushi over uh, big here. So it was very quick. It was a short match. Uh, Ghetto was not in the match much. It was mostly Finlay steamrolling these guys for a lot of it. Uh, it was his return match since the New Japan Cup. He had to withdraw from the New Japan Cup. Turns out he had a, a terrible ear, an inner ear infection that was bad enough that it damaged his balance. He had to go to the hospital, uh, which is why he had to withdraw from the New Japan Cup. Uh, this was mostly him on offense until Ghetto got in, and then Ghetto fell apart. Uh, and uh, Bushi ended up getting a figure four style leg lock on him that he has not named yet. He mentioned that, yeah, that he needs to come up with a name for this hold. So a little bit of a new thing. He, he didn't just do the MX, the, the lung blower uh, move. It was a uh, submission hold. And I, I think the previous finish, this finish, mostly just to remind people that it's not just Despe and Hiromu in the Super Juniors coming up. Yeah, this was this was good to just remind people like let's heat up some other people, let's remind people that the best of the super juniors is coming and put some of these guys over. And you know, it would have been nice if they had done it a little bit earlier than the middle of April of Sakura Genesis, but at least they're doing it at all. And I think we're gonna see a little bit more of this at Wrestling Tentaku before we go into it. And I'm fine with that. This was the right build, the right guys. Romo doesn't need the push. Ghetto's not wrestling in the best of the Super Juniors. Makes perfect sense. Yeah, and as Venk and Bjorn mentions right there, too, he says, Ghetto taking pins so Finlay doesn't have to. Yeah, I mean, that's why he does that. So we get a lot of questions about why is Ghetto putting himself in all these matches is so he can lose them and the other people don't have to. He doesn't have to worry about his spot on the card. You know, that's that's one thing. Finlay when you book can yourself, lose as long as it's not his fault. Well, yeah, and that's the other thing is, you know, Ghetto can always protect everybody right there. But really, Giotto does the same thing for Hontai and uh, G.O.D. He, he's the one that takes the fall so they don't have to. Moving on to the next match. And like I said, we're going to get through these fairly quickly. We have a uh, the six-man tag here. This is just five guys, three of them anyway. We have Doki, Sanada, and Yuya Uemura taking on Jeff Cobb, Great Okan, and Callum Newman. And this was, uh, you know, pretty good. It could be a trios title preview match. We'll get into the Taiwan show in a little bit. Uh, we also set up a possible King of Pro Wrestling thing going forward. Jeff Cobb did Jeff Cobb things in this one, just the incredibly strong man stuff. And uh, Uwe Mora was selling a lot of the way, but he came back and hit the deadbolt suplex on Great Okan. So I mentioned that I dreaded this, that Uwe Mora might end up in one of these silly uh matches but there's actually a lot cooking for Yuya Uemura because he mm -hmm. and Sonata ended up challenging Bishamon we'll get to all that uh then they're in this trios tournament coming up in Taiwan and okay. Uemura might have a set uh, a match set up for the uh King of Pro Wrestling title so there's a lot there's a lot are, cooking right here wait are they the fourth team i thought it was uh i thought it was LIJ House of Torture United Empire, and then Tanahashi, Bolton, Oleg, and Toriano. I don't even well, think Jack Five Guys are in it. Well, I'm going back to this thing, the preview here for the uh, – for I'm bringing it back. The Wrestling World 2024 full card and preview. Mm -hmm. It is – They're tagging, uh, right? They're doing the tag team match? Well, okay, yeah. The, yeah, they, they have the tag team title match there. Right. And then, you know, but they, they could be contenders for, yeah, you're right. Okay. So they're not in the trios tournament, but this could be a thing where, uh, 
They could know, if, after. They could be if one United of the Empire top. wins it, then they could have you know, then they have something on them right there. So, I mean, yeah. you know, House of Torture is going to win it, and then we're going to go back to Jeff Five Guys versus House of Torture. <laughs> <laughs> no, you know, it's it, yeah, as long as it's Lij and just Five Guys again for another two years, it seems like. But yeah, there you go. But either way, this was a Deadbolt Suplex uh, victory right here, and setting something up for later again regarding United Empire. There's some discord going on there, uh, so th this is all to keep. United Empire on the, uh, you know, get on the down. They're they're taking falls. They're losing matches, and uh, this was all part of that, which would come to fruition a little bit later in uh, post match comments, which we'll get to in a little while because there's more business to do before we get to to that confrontation. This match was fine, if largely forgettable on the on the greater card in general because there are just things that happened later on that made you just kind of forget about it. But Jeff Cobb stuck around and he ended up doing commentary with Chris Charlton because Walker Stewart was unable to be at the show. And uh, he was a mixed bag. He was fine, but, you know, very, uh, very loose. <laughs> he was, wasn't he? He was, he was doing a stand-up act for most of this one. So it felt like it was what Mercedes wanted to be when she was uh, on AEW the other day, like trying to huh. do her commentary at ringside for that match. And it just like, it's an acquired skill, people. Not everyone has it. And so far, I feel like we're 0 for 2. <laughs> <laughs> After that, though, what's the next match? Ooh. Go ahead and bring that up. Now, here, now we're talking. Now, this was the best match of Sakura Genesis. Yes. We had the tornado tag match between the War Dogs of Clark Connors and Drill Maloney, Catch 2 2, Akira and TJP, and Kevin Knight and Kushida. So, this match was wonderful, and it was some speed stuff early from Kevin Knight, but the War Dogs took, took control. They put a lot of heat on Knight. Knight's highlights, and there's one in every match with this guy. He's just phenomenal. Hit a springboard from the ring over the barricade to all of his opponents there that were over the barricade and in the crowd. Covered a great distance and a great height with that. Uh, they gave each team a little moment of shine where you thought they were going to win it. Like TGP hit his final cut in a Mamba splash on Drilla Maloney, but that the pin was broken up. Uh, later on, he misted Maloney. He kind of came out with his face kind of half painted like the Oswang and all this. Uh, the Jet Setters got a couple of big moves in that looked like they were going to win it, but they went for that break dancing move where they grab each other's ankles and roll across the ring. Uh, but Clark Connors speared Kevin Knight out of that move. And uh, after that, it was all war dogs. They, Maloney hit a gore, uh, drill a killer on Kushida that looks brutal. I'm always waiting for him to break somebody's neck on that move, but he seems to know how to do it. Connor said a no chaser on Kevin Knight, full clip on Kushida. So in the end, it was the war dogs just going on an absolute run and just running through the jet setters and, and everybody else there. So a strong defense for the war dogs here there was a message sent that this war dogs team is going to be uh quite a mountain for anyone else to climb i thought they looked very impressive i love the match had a blast watching it everyone looked great i came away watching that because i ended up watching it twice i uh this was the first match i ended up watching with dave over at his house because i was like you have to watch this match i don't know what anyone's told you about this one but you just have to watch it and um this was like kevin knight highlight reel match like you basically could just take everything that he did in that match cut it together into a highlight reel and show any wrestling company this and you're like you need to hire this dude because he's very <laughs> very good <laughs> um i had a lot of fun with this match uh i was a little curious at the end when maloney stormed out and Clark connor's kind of had that look of like this didn't seem like this was part of the plan and I have questions, but I also don't have the answers as to what it was. We have I have a little bit of an answer as to what it was. Oh, he great. he bust he busted his eardrum during the match. Oh, so he was just in he was just in a lot of pain, he needed to get the hell out of there for a second to see if he was okay. Well, I mean, with uh, all those lights and the sound, like just get out of that. Yeah, yeah, I get it. Yeah, yeah. He busted his eardrum. Maloney can't catch a break, tears his triceps, but you know, he busts his eardrum. Just it seems like something Couple happens. People to the can't guy. catch a break tonight. Well, that's true, but you know, and I but I do feel bad for Maloney, who's super talented and just keeps getting hurt. <laughs> it'll be okay, though. Like he'll, once he's on his run, he's going to be on a run. So yeah. it's just not his time yet. But yeah. like, so we'll, everybody who can see him play, if they know that that dude is got momentum. Yeah, yeah, and that's and there's a really good team and things. So yeah, he was hurt. Now 
let's go on to what happened afterwards in post-match comments. So Jeff Cobb said some things uh, on commentary about TJP that he's not totally sure that he's the leader that TJP thinks he is. That was a little pretty harsh. And then afterwards, in post-match comments where TJP and Akira are swearing that they're going to keep going after these belts, Great Okan just walks in on the whole thing and says, hey, 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 this isn't going well. When I joined the United Empire, it was supposed to be a collective and there was no leader. That's how he said, with, he said this many times with Osprey. And Osprey has said that there isn't a leader, although we all knew Osprey was the, the top guy. Right. Uh, it was supposed to be a collective, no leader, all for one, one for all. He said, ever since TJP appointed himself captain, things have been going wrong. Uh, all of the United Empire had first round exits in the New Japan Cup. They lose here. And he tells TJP, if you want to be captain, you either have to bring results or we will no longer support you. And uh, that was uh, a bit of a plot point there. And we'll have to see what ends up happening. Now, TJP is not in the trios tournament this weekend, uh, but uh, the United Empire has a team in there. I agree with what you've said and what Venkin is saying over here too, that it's probably going to be a house of torture win uh, uh, in that one, just to set things up. When they, and then that just five guys team can chase them. The Hantai teams can chase, you know, that, that's a a championship it's that can a bounce fine around a lot. Feud to leave them like put them off in the trio of tournament. You can have your match every week, uh, kind of ever on the pre-show on the road to shows where they do their house torture thing. That's fine, you know. Show will have his belt. It'll be fine. But TJP is not in best of super juniors, but Akira is. So wait, I thought you know he is. Isn't he? Oh wait, yeah, wait a minute. Have, wait a minute. Let me look. Let me look. No, he's in it. He's in it. He's. I'm sorry. I'm. I. I had. I, the... I got every one of those images in there. I was like, no, I'm okay. Sorry. My apologies. Like, oh, he is in it. Oh, so the good. question for you here, Jeremy, is: uh, Is TJP going to come through? No. Or is this going to be a thing where he ends up getting kicked out? What do you? Where do you think Dude, this is going? I told you after Will left that like I think they have a plan for TJP. Yeah. And I didn't realize the plan was to bury the motherfucker. <laughs> no. Um, no, I just, he lost in the New Japan Cup. He could have been the upset special if they'd gone that route, but they had better plans than, than what I even proposed. They went hard with Jeff Cobb saying, if you want to be a leader, you got to win. Okay. I love you, buddy, but you know, like, you got to do this. And I was like, I'm listening to this and I'm just like, they're really saying this on here. Like, they're – TJP just lost another, like, title match. They are really burying this guy. So, unless there's a come through, and I'm not even 100% sure that, you know, there is even a payoff to this that everyone is going to be in love with. It is, in fact, still TJP. You know, you're invested in a relationship with Akira, and you're invested in the chase for the tag title. But I'm not necessarily sure that you're invested in anything more beyond that when it is with him. So the direction this is going is I'm not necessarily sure it's leading to anything other than, you know, a turn, uh, a, like a dissolution, something like that, because it does not feel like it is in the cards for a positive outcome. If that makes any sense. War dogs need another guy. Sure. <laughs> I know you don't care. <laughs> I mean, just no, says, like, you tell me that, and I'm just like, I'm thinking about it. I'm like, yeah, sure, that makes sense. I'm not in love with it, but at the same time, you need to shake things up. And the best of the Super Juniors is great for a moment of dissolution. If last year mm -hmm. it's uh, Baloney that does it, and this year you have two of the War Dogs in it, and you have three of United Empire, and all of a sudden that three of United Empire becomes three of the the war dogs that is in fact really interesting to me the uh colin has a question by the way is this taiwan show where they crown the new never open weight six-man tag team champions live and not only is it not live it's not listed as being vod it, we don't know when it might come up on uh new japan world if at oh, all. oh right i think it, i think it's airing live uh only in japanese and then it'll be Okay, because I went, I just looked before the show, I looked on NJPW World at the schedule and it's not on it. So if if it is, if they did it, it's just they didn't put it on the schedule part of it. I'm bringing up the calendar again now. Here it is. And it's on the full card and preview. And here's what it says. 
you can watch live on New Japan World with English to follow huh. on. Wow. Okay. All right. Well, there you have it. Because I'm looking at the 14th right here on the live schedule on this page, and it's there's it's just a blank for the 14th. Yeah. If you go to that on April 8th and the news right. under top it, it's right there, right under the main screen. Okay. All right. Well, there you go. So I had I to do a lot of diligent research. There was a lot of information to unpack going into this this week. There's been, Steven, there's... I do not blame you at all for getting a little bit of these details. There was a lot. <laughs> well, there is. And, and also there's some contradictory stuff because they don't put it on the schedule, but they put it in the preview. The other thing they did was if you look at the card, if you go on the schedule and then click on the Taiwan card, they have a team in the tag team tournament twice going into today. And so there, there, there's some dots uh, not getting onto I's and some crosses not getting onto T's over there. There, There's some things. So it, like, if you look at this, I'm going to bring it up now too, just to make sure I'm not nuts. But uh, if you go to the schedule for the Taiwan show, click on mm -hmm. schedule and then click on wrestling world 2024 in Taiwan the never open weight tournament is Tanahashi, Yano, and Oleg versus Great Okan, Akira, and Newman. The next match is Tanahashi, Yano, and Oleg against Takagi, Suji, and Bushi. Yeah, I think uh, somebody might be a little bit overworked. Maybe so. Chris? I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> well, hmm. well, maybe the intern got a hold of uh, got a hold of the to do list and uh, interned it wrong. You can blame <laughs> it on the intern. That is entirely okay. All right. Well, we'll do that. But uh, yeah, all right. So I apologize I for any confusion for you. Yeah, go ahead. Do you think? Uh, do you think it would be too early at Windy City Riot to have TJP do a turn if he were to be an Eddie mm -hmm. Kingston partner, but then he went and and joined Bullet Club? It's a possibility. I, I think it might be more dramatic if it happens during Best of the Super Juniors with Akira. Yep. Yeah. You could do it there. You just. You, I think you're right. I just wanted to put it out there because all of a sudden we were asking yeah. about joining Bullet Club and they have that four, each one of them has mystery partners kind of thing. And I don't know. You yeah, do things on a pay-per-view to get interest. Sure. And uh, it, I think you're right on a tail end of the best of the Super Juniors seems a lot more likely with a feud between Akira and TJP going forward. But... That's the most interesting thing you can do with TJP is put him against Akira because people are invested in that. All right. So let's get through the rest of the card because we've got Windy City Riot to preview for the love of God. After this, now we had a tag team title match uh, between Bishamon and Chase Owens and Kenta. This felt like a course correction for me. Uh, it was fine. We got a more energetic Chase Owens than usual. He pretty much carried this match for his team anyway. Uh, a lot of C triggers. Uh, Bishamon uh, showed some great timing as a team right there. It was a Shoto finish on Owens. And this felt more like just getting things back on track, getting the belts back on Bishamon. And then afterwards, they were challenged by Uemura and Sonata. That match will be in Taiwan. So there you have it. Uh, and it's it, Bishamon's a better team. I'd rather see them with the tag belts and in these prominent spots and Chase Owens and Kenta. So I'm, I'm down with this. And what else are you going to do with Goto and Yoshihashi? Really, I mean, either one of them are going to be singles champions at this stage so this is probably the best use this is it felt purely academic you know yeah. like it was a great textbook match wasn't it was clinical and it got from <laughs> point a to point b this was also the point of the show where i felt like oh this show is just putting everything back the way it was before wrestle kingdom Cool. <laughs> yes, I mean, part of this there's I, I have a lot of questions about the booking in january february and all this stuff but yeah this does feel like course correction work and yeah, uh right back where we were right. and after this we're gonna go we, after this they did the video where they announced the super junior contestants we'll talk about that right after we get through all these matches so after this we had the unfortunate incident of the iwgp junior heavyweight title match show and yo so as you have almost certainly heard one of the first moves match. one of the first moves of this match yo went for a basement drop kick came down on and bra of course you brace yourself with your arm when you do that and his shoulder dislocated and now he tried the best he could he was in a lot of pain and he was d trying to get through this thing he managed to wander over to show who was very smart and show just went into the corner and waited and kind of played heel and taunted a little bit, but stayed off of him, certainly. And then he went over and delivered one stomp to show uh, who had 
who just kind of watched him walk up and just to see how he was doing. He made that one stop and realized there's no way on earth I can do a match with a dislocated shoulder. Yeah. I have never had one of these. Everyone I know that has tells me it's one of the worst pains I've ever felt in their life was when their shoulder slips out like that. And oh, I uh, this from a kid at Mel Gibson and like lethal weapon or lethal <laughs> weapon two. With yeah. the like the shoulder, I'm like, going, like, oh, if that's all you have to do. I'm sure you're gonna be fine. And he's like, oh no, that's movie, that's movie, movie BS. <laughs> it's terribly unfortunate for show or for Yo rather. Uh, for for Yo, uh, he was he swore he swore in English. You know, he just was so upset that he wasn't able to do this match. And really, he had done a lot of work, Jeremy, mm-hmm. for this thing. They had done. I mean, possession of nine tenths of the law, and he just <sighs> had to give it up like that. Well, you know, the, the whole, but seriously, the all in the build up to this, you'll work really hard to get something out of this match. And then for it to end in a minute and a half and barely get going. Is the, is the uh, junior heavyweight title right now. Yeah. It's, it's just, uh, you know, it's just a frustrating thing for him. And now, I mean, who knows if he's going to be able to work the super juniors. He's supposed to be in. We don't know. Super yeah, I mean, then, they'll so, probably hold off until the very last bit uh, in order to get there. So, as I mentioned earlier, we were watching this. I was watching this with Dave, and I didn't know the results. I didn't know anything that happened. But when I turned to the next match, he has a fire stick, and it's a little like funky. And I pressed the button, and I saw that the whole match segment went 12 minutes. And all of a sudden, my hair on the back of my head went up like, this match is fucking 12 minutes. What the hell? Yeah. And then and we had the entrances, and then. Within like 30 seconds of the match, like he did the three moves and then he did that basement drop kick. And Dave and I just looked at each other like, what the fuck happened? And we, and he like, he undid a stopwatch and we restarted the match because obviously there's only like three things. And we watched it and we just watched him do the basement drop kick and just watched his shoulder pop out. And we're like, oh, all right. Hmm. And uh, so we did, we watched the show just normally. And then they did the pivot with the post post show like angles and all that, which you're gonna get to. Yeah, because I, I don't think that was a pivot. I think that was the, that was I gonna be the, was... that was gonna be what was gonna happen after the match, right? Yeah, yeah. I, I think, like go for it. <laughs> I think Show was gonna win the match. I think Show yeah. was going to successfully defend. So I think what we got after this is exactly what we were going to get, no matter mm-hmm. what. Mm-hmm. Uh, and Venka mentioned it would have been worse if Yo were supposed to win. Certainly, yeah, it would have. Uh, but I don't think it was. I, my guess was it was supposed to be some sort of hook and crook by. Uh, uh, I mean, show. this was House of Torture. Like this was pancake. The House of Pancakes for House of Torture. This was right in their wheelhouse. What was going to happen? So afterward, Kosei Fujita came out and challenged Show, and then shortly after that, Doki came out and challenged, and they were both looking to challenge him. And Show, of course, being the heel, just said no. Neither, no, neither one of you. And uh, Fujita hit a springboard drop kick and laid show out. Uh, I suppose after cheating, that was supposed to be the catharsis for the fans. A little bit of a happy moment yeah. there. Uh, and then uh, laid him out. And then Doki <laughs> grabs the belt and just says, you're not worthy to be champion. So here's what's going to happen. Fujita and I are going to wrestle for your right to challenge us as champion, which is just kind of a backwards way of just, you know, giving him the middle finger, basically. Uh, so. In Taiwan, we are going to see Kosei Fujita and Doki with the winner getting a future title match with Sho. So that's how that uh, was was done there. So you think Dentaku? Because there's not a whole lot of options before uh, <laughs> the Super Juniors. Right. And, and yes, yeah, I think that's where it's going to be. I mean, you got to have a card for that, Dentaku. Right. And right now we don't have a whole lot of information on it at all. So uh, right I now, think I that's probably like, where we're, right, we're, we're getting a headline of Yuya Uemura versus uh, Great Okan is, is our headline match right now. <laughs> yeah, well, there, or this, or there could be a never open weight six man match once we have new yeah. champions and all that sort of stuff. So that'll all come together after this weekend, I think. We'll start seeing matches announced. Speaking of the man who is breaking the internet right now. Man, we have John. Oh boy, uh, you're not talking about Moxley either. All right, I'm so we about had... Shota. Have you seen a haircut lately? He's really just so such a heartthrob. <laughs> well, he's a handsome man, but we had John Moxley and Shota Umino taking on Ren Narita and Jack Perry. Now, I haven't heard much about Jack Perry this week. Have you? I don't oh. know what's going on with him. Uh, so... <laughs> okay, <laughs> let me let me just put it to you this way. I again, where I was. When the collision news dropped that oh uh, the Young Bucks were going to unveil footage 
You were at about, Dave's house, weren't you? I was there. Oh my lord. I I I can't talk about it, but it was it was a whole lot of horse shit. <laughs> <laughs> I believe it. They, you know, uh, we're not going to get into all that on here, but that would be a whole other episode of this show to talk about what happened on Dynamite. But the tag team match here: John Moxley and Shota Umino in the House of Torture, Jack Barry, Ren Narita. Uh, this was fairly basic stuff. Uh, Narita used the push-up bar on Mox, was choking him with it. Uh, Umino uh, tried to help. At one point, Narita was lined up to nail Mox with the push-up bar. Shota shoved Mox out of the way and took the push-up bar. Uh, unfortunately, uh, Narita, his aim was bad, and he ended up hitting Shota in the chest, and Shota had to act like he was hitting the head and knocked cold, but, you know, it, it was fine. Uh, Perry did some Young Bucks moves. This is a little bit of a nod to the boys. And uh, this is like we expected. It's it, Moxley got the victory. Uh, he beat Ren Narita with the uh, Death Rider and then uh, would come out later on to confront Naito. So basically what we thought, putting over Moxley, uh, he and Shota are you know, still a team. Shota sacrificing himself for his mentor. We expect that to be a little bit more water on the seeds that have been planted for down the way. And uh, this accomplished everything I thought it was supposed to. Yeah, uh, the only thing I don't, I was looking at something else at, during a, Brief bit. I don't think you mentioned it, but if you did, good job by you. Jack Perry doing the Young Buck moves in the middle yeah. of the match. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. They're laying it on pretty thick. I don't think Jack <laughs> Perry is going to be in New Japan much longer past Windy City at the rate everything seems to be going. Although, frankly speaking, between you and me, Stephen, mm. I loved having Jack Perry there. I thought he was great. And if he wants to come back, anytime. Yeah, and, and you know it does. It's not necessarily the end because there's a Forbidden Door show later on this year that they sure. could possibly build to. But I, I think Perry's going to be pretty busy uh, very if soon. I, if I day. had to guess, Wendy City is going to be the denouement for now, and then we see him aff affect the FTR Young Bucks yeah. match at Dynasty. Uh, that just seems like yeah. as, as Tyler there you mentions. Go. It's all Tyler Muirn mentions. Uh, it's all FTR's fault. They took advantage of that nice boy Jack Perry. Oh, I tell you what, you can't. You can't. And then Beckett got court. this. It ended with the uh, when it ended with an yep. elbow drop. And then ended with an elbow drop. That's very true. So there you go. It was uh, you know just a match basically to get uh, to to further along other stories. So everybody's so petty. John Moxley <laughs> just walks to wrestle. Be I like know. John Moxley. Although he took the exploder from Ren in the in this match. Mm -hmm. He won the same after that. His I back was messed up real bad. Yeah, almost dumped him on his head. You could watch him just moving around and like, that guy without love of life after that exploder soup on the floor. I'll tell you what, that is a long-ass flight home when you have a bad oh, back. Yeah. So, after that, we had the Never Open Weight title. This is the other course correction of the night. Shingo Takagi and Evil. Uh, this was uh, the overbooked mess we figured it would be. Uh, Kanemaru came out with his ref shirt, but Marty Asami threw him out of the ring. I am not going to go into every bit of the House of Torture shenanigans on this thing. In the end, the LIJ team overcame it all. Uh, the finish came when Takagi ended up getting the bottle away from Kanemaru, and he spit the whiskey in Evil's eyes, and Yujiro threw powder, but he missed and hit Evil. It was a lot of things going on in this thing. Uh Here's one thing I will say for this match, Jeremy. I'm going to give House of Torture a little bit of credit here. I have complained over and over again that they don't do the heel stuff well. Uh, the referee bumps look bad and all this kind of stuff. Here's what happened in this match. That Yujiro, for the most part, tied up the referee effectively from the outside like a manager, like an old school manager would, so that when Evil, who is the best of the House of Torture guys at getting heel heat, old school heel heat, like choking somebody with a hidden piece of tape or something. He's not bad at that. They distracted the referee fairly effectively. When they needed to take Marty Asami out, they didn't just like grab him in a magic killer and he's he's hurt for a year. They Bushi tried to blow mist in uh, Evil's eyes and he hit Marty. You know, like every time the referee wasn't looking at something House of Torture was doing, it's because there was an actual distraction going. Now you can argue about how much distraction and referee stuff we want in New Japan. Still not my favorite thing, but at least they took care to do it in a way that makes a little bit of sense. Uh, 
And but afterwards, it all went chaotic. I mean, Kanemaru Mara was in with a ref shirt. Hiroma was in with a ref shirt. Neither one of them were actually the referees in the match, which they made clear, even though they said Kanemaru Mara was the guest referee. But none of it. He even counted a fast three count, but it didn't count. And in the end, Red Shoes ended up coming in because Marty was blind, made the pin, and we got Shingo Takagi as the never open way champion, who probably should have been the whole time. I mean, you pretty much covered most of it. I. I had a good time with the match. I thought for what it was, you know, payoff wasn't mm-hmm. the biggest baby face in all of wrestling winning the biggest title, but it came pretty close. It felt like, you know, the re- good was go good was winning in new Japan for, for just one moment. It was a, it was a feel good moment of the night. Uh, in, in all honesty, Shingo is the man. Shingo is one of the best wrestlers in the world. Uh, yeah, it it's hard to argue yeah. at this point. And, uh, <laughs> just him having a main title. Oprah was in Japan handing out ref shirts. You get a ref shirt. You get a ref shirt. Everybody gets a ref shirt. Yeah, very true. But anyway, point is, uh, Shingo is, is, has that, and uh, he's got challengers lined up because right after that, Gabe Kidd came in oh and damn near killed God. everybody. So Gabe Kidd ran out with the War Dogs and attack. They laid out Shingo, uh, and then he cuts a promo and a half is what he did right there. He said that Tanahashi, who was on commentary with the Japanese team, was getting screwed over by Tony Khan, and it was embarrassing. He all he says he almost offed himself twice, uh, and uh, for this kind, you know, it, it, because I got that pro- confirmed, but true, by the way, it is, yeah. No, well, remember he took time off when he was a young lion because he was having, and you know, he was open about this that he was having mental health issues and not spreading gossip. He talked about it uh, that he he was he has had issues with that before, and you know he says, but now I'm not even booked on this show, and he's just again the classic war dogs i'm not being properly respected thing turning into a violent rampage and uh gabe kid versus shingo takagi hell yes i mean i can absolutely that's a feud i would watch uh all day and twice on sunday i i am here for it it is a proper course correction for the never open way title gabe kid promo was filthy absolutely basement dirty filthy and it was awesome uh, he basically intimated that Tanahashi, uh, should fight Tony Khan <laughs> to Tanahashi's face. Uh, he expressed all the self harm that he has done to himself because he loves the company so much. Also, a heel thing to say, you know, like making the company responsible for his his pain is is a choice, but it's all heel stuff. Yes. you know, and at the same time you felt like his passion was absolutely true. I am rooting for Gabe Kidd right now. And I believe more than anyone else, he is intent on grabbing the ring and not letting go. And there are people that are getting that opportunity and he is taking that opportunity. And I think there's a big difference right there. When the dust settles, Jeremy, should Gabe Kidd be the leader of the Bullet Club? Man, he's making a hell of an argument, isn't he? He really is. And and I, again, I have been somebody who's been on Finlay's side. I've said that David Finlay is doing exactly his job, which is have good matches, cut pretty decent promos, you know. But again, it, there's just so much baggage on Finlay, and that we've seen him as a mid card guy for so many years that the crowd is having a difficult time buying him. Kid doesn't have that, and I just think that maybe in the end he might end up being the leader of Bullet Club. How long can you keep Gabe Kidd a heel? Oh, well, that's the other side of it, isn't it? That's yeah. that's a fair point. I mean, that pendulum could swing back the other way. That's, he's, already, that's he's already got that momentum. Like, there are people that... Is it hard to say that there is not, like, a stone-cold energy to him? You know, like that, that rugged... I don't know. Just like... I feel like he has a charisma about him and I can't put my finger on it mm. where you feel like he's real, but he's still a pro wrestler. Mm. And there are other wrestlers who felt real as a pro wrestler. And one of the closest comps that I can have is that like, he just feels like stone cold in which like you are legitimately believing in this guy, even though you are abundantly aware that this is all fake. All right. Yeah. So we will have uh, Gabe Kidd and Shingo Takagi. No one's, I don't oh, think yeah. anyone's going to be disappointed with that. 
After that, we had Tetsuya Naito defending the IWGP World Heavyweight title against Yoda Suji. Now, we felt like this one was pretty academic uh, as far as that goes, just because he had the Moxley match coming up. It just didn't seem like the right time to switch it, and it wasn't. The Yoda Suji, your job, if you're a challenger in this situation, is to have a really good match so it looks like you belong in the main event. I think that was mission accomplished because this was a good match. Mm -hmm. the, the Tornado match was a better match, uh, but I think this is the second best match on the card. I enjoyed this. The fans were into it right away, and uh, that, that's one thing that the, the crowd was ready for it. Uh, there was a lot of Yoda Suji for the first 15 minutes, basically, because with some work from Naito on Suji's neck, getting him ready for Destino, but most of it was Suji because the burden was on them to establish Suji as a credible challenger. So we got that in the early uh -huh. part of the match. And it was uh, it was pretty good. At about the 20-minute mark, things kicked up. Naito came back strong. The big move started. Uh, there was a, a nice little bit in the middle where Naito, you know how he hits the Destino as a counter to another move, but that's not yes. the finishing Destino. You know, uh, he hit that one, but then uh Suji ducked a move, turned around, and hit a short gene blast. Again, not the full version. But with both guys hitting their big moves there, the crowd really got into it. Uh, Suji hit a superplex at about the half hour mark and put Naito in a Boston Crab. That was a throwback because Naito had beaten him with a Boston Crab finish before Suji went off to uh, England and Mexico on his excursion. So that was a, yeah, a callback. Very deep callback, deep cut there. And some near falls followed from Suji. Naito countered a gene blast with a monkey flip. Then Naito hit a gene right. blast of that his own. That looked painful, by the way, that, yeah. that monkey flip. Looked great. Painful, though. Yeah. And uh, Suji fought off the Destino for a while, but then he uh, Naito hit it out of a suplex. And then he hit the full version of it for the pin. This uh, went 34 minutes. I did not think it dragged a whole lot. I thought I thought it was good. And I thought that, again, Suji's job was just to look like a main event guy. And I think he did it. He didn't need to win this one. But I don't think that it uh, takes him down any either. I, I think it's a matter of if, if Yoda Suji is announced for a main event, that you just say, yeah, he's the, this is a main event wrestler. It feels right. And uh, it, was, it was a good match, a good showing. And I think it helped both guys. I thought it was a good match. I do not think it was a great match. I thought but, that there was something missing in the charisma department here in this match. No, I'll disagree on the that. Two, between, between the two wrestlers, because the energy was there, but I felt like I have seen Yoda Suji just eating up that spotlight when he comes out there and just owning his presence. And I didn't quite feel that this time. I felt like... There was something about this one that he was just like, I thought he was, he, I felt like he was going to be more ready for the dance than he was. Not that he wasn't ready, but I was, I was prepared for like a blow away, like I am here and I am Yoda Suji. But what I thought I saw was I'm here and I'm ready, question mark? Oh, I, and, I disagree. I, I don't agree with you on that. That's just me. I'm just, yeah. I'm just saying, like, I feel like they could have had a better match. And whether it was a confidence, a vibe, who was taking charge or whatever, like, there was just a little bit something missing. And that's hmm. all I'm trying to say. Well, I'm not trying to say it was an all-time classic either, but I, I, I do feel like it was a good match. I thought it was a good showing from him. And the crowd was into it. Like, as far yes. as the charisma goes, I, that's where I disagree because that crowd was – going for everything there they were the end. willing that match to be great but yeah. there were moments in it where it was just like i felt like i just it didn't it didn't coalesce the way i thought it was going to at the level i thought it was going to it's also fair to point out by the way that in these matches and this is becoming a bit of a pattern that naito's body starts to give out late in these matches mm -hmm. now too and he's he's not necessarily able to do some things uh, that he would normally. You know, we saw that in the Sonata match with Sonata that was banged up. You know, that was the one like his arm was was hurt. Uh, but you know, some of the stuff with you know like Naito's not a kid anymore. And so sometimes I think when they go 30, 35 minutes, that it starts to show on him a little bit as well. But I, I do you again, have I, I was gonna. Crowd was you have in your notes how many Destino he hit? Duncan was one. No, I don't. That's a good question, Duncan. I I don't know like exactly how four? many. Yeah, like it was several. But yeah. only one 
full one. You know, that's the that's the key. He's got to get the full setup. And just like the Rainmaker, you, for some reason, Okada can clothesline somebody, but it's not the same as if he does it with one arm, with the one arm, the short arm. So yeah. all in all, very good show. Not a show of the year or anything like that. There were some unfortunate injuries and uh, mm. pivots on the card that you know doesn't make it an all timer, but. If you're looking to watch even more wrestling than everything that has happened over the past few weeks, uh, you could do worse than Secure Genesis. It was fine. And the, and the key is, you know, again, it, it's all about building Suji up for the future. So that's yes. that's the big key there. Yes. Uh, and he's going to be fine. Like, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so Windy City Riot is tomorrow, and we will have a live show afterwards, as you've mentioned. But we're going to preview it here uh, now. And uh, we have uh, a strong survivor match to start off with Matt Vandegrift and Zane J. Now, do you know what the strong survivor match part means? Nope. Yeah, me neither. And I can't find anything necessarily unless I missed something and I may have. But Let's see if I can find. Yeah, go ahead and do that because I'll go through some of these other matches that don't really have a story to them so much. And then maybe we can do that. Uh, we also will have uh, one I'm looking forward to, Viva Van and Mina Shirakawa, who's all over everything. She was just on Dynamite last night. She's been on Ring of Honor. Uh, she's uh, been uh, part you of You know what I think it is? I What's think that? if you keep winning your match on the opening card as a survivor, you get the opening match on the next one. There you have it. Okay. So uh, Matt Vandegriff and Zane J. Uh, Vandegriff's pretty good. I don't I don't know. I'm not all that familiar with Jay. I've seen Vandegriff. They, uh, they definitely make he's his right. render, make him look much more interesting than he is in person. He's, uh, he's very opening cardish. <laughs> okay. He's not bad, though. He's, he's not, not bad. But he just, like... He looks like the frontier zone for the domestic version. Got it. All right. So Viva Van Amir Shirakawa versus Trisha Dora and Alex Windsor. So there's there's that one. And then, Shirakawa just making all the appearances. You think we see Mariah May as a result of everything going on? Yeah, well, you know, uh, could be. Uh, and and Vankin uh, thinks that Mina is going to feud with Tony at uh, Forbidden Door. So I, I'd be down with that. Probably possible. I mean, it's, it, if you wanted to bring Mariah May in and then do a little thing with Mariah May and Alex Windsor or Mariah May and, you know, uh, Trisha Dora, mm -hmm. it'd be worse. Yeah. So, yeah, uh, Mina, she's been all over everything. So uh, I think this is another good uh, opportunity right there. Viva so. Viva had a good match uh, at Battle of Valley the last time uh, she's been on a New Japan card. So they're bringing her back and, you know, we'll see where she does. So there's that one. Uh, I would imagine that uh, Mina would probably go over on that one. So after that, we have an interesting one. Minoru Suzuki against Ren Narita. Now, this has been a long time coming. So after Ren Narita turned and went with uh, the uh, House of Torture. From what so faction? He didn't, he didn't. I don't know. What faction were they in? Well, they were in. Well, they, they were part of <laughs> Strong Style. Speaking uh, of Strong Style. So, but he didn't turn on Suzuki. He turned on Umino, but... After that happened, Minoru Suzuki did do a backstage comment uh, that said that I now consider you an enemy. And one of these days you will pay for this. And uh, so this is it here. A little follow up to that. Uh, Suzuki took it. Uh, it took offense to that. He uh, eschewed strong style and went with the House of Torture thing. So, uh, you know, this is just a match here between uh, these two uh, after a long time coming who used to be uh, partners. I'm looking forward to this. I think the ascension of Ren Narita continues. Uh, I, I look forward to him getting out of a package pile driver and taking out Minoru Suzuki because honestly, if they were to do anything different, I think it would be madness. Mm -hmm. And Suzuki is just basically a free agent now. He, he yes. just takes uh, only the bookings he wants because he's Minoru Suzuki and he can. Why not? Not a bad way to be. After that, NJPW Strong Women's Championship. Stephanie Vacare against Azumi. So I don't expect a title change here. I think they're going to stick with Vacare, but I am curious to see how Vacare and, and Azumi mesh. Uh, her high speed style is very different than some of the other Joshi wrestlers that Vacare has been in with, certainly different than Julia, but both these women are very, very good. So I'm excited to see that high speed versus. Uh, Vicar's kind of heelish, uh, sometimes bully energy to her. Uh, I think this could be uh, a lot of fun to watch. And, and obviously, uh, both of them within their own styles are excellent. So I'm curious to see them in there together. Are we going to get a style of clash or a style of mesh? <laughs> I think we're getting a style of mesh on this one. I think I they're think both very good that they neither one will allow this match to fail. Right. Yeah. No, I think it's going to be a, a, a nice one there. So after that, the strong open weight tag team championship. That's El Fantasmo and Hikaleo 
defending against, we now know fully officially, it is uh, TMDK, the West Coast Wrecking Crew, and the team of uh, uh, Filthy Tom Waller and Fred Rosser. Tom Waller recently on Filthy the show. Filthy all day. So I would imagine that uh, West Coast Wrecking Crew and Rosser and Waller will probably end up uh, getting in each other's way at some point in this. Where do you see this one going? I could see TMDK winning this. I could. But I think it's going to be a retention because I don't love it when teams lose in four ways, like the retaining champions lose in four ways. Mm. I just, I feel like they're more spectacle in party matches to have like everyone get a little bit of heat, but a little bit of a crime in doing the title change. I hope there's a story to it and a change, but with uh, the West Coast Wrecking Crew and Filthy All Day just kind of having eyes on each other and, uh, you know, TMDK just being a great tag team, but I'd rather see them with eyes on the IWGP title. You know, Hikaleo okay. and ELP are the right guys to walk out with these titles. I'm, I'm yeah. really looking forward to this match, though. Really yeah. looking forward to it. I am, too. I think there's going to be angles coming from it that'll pay off in other ways down the road between the West Coast Wrecking Crew and Roster and Lawler, uh, probably. But uh, also, I mean, if they wanted to do TMDK, you could. And... Because the real story, again, like you mentioned, you're right, the, the IWGP tag team titles, but they still have a tag team tournament that they could win and get to that. So they could, it's only April, so they could hold these for a little while and then move, you know, lose them and then move up to the to the heavyweights. But they could also just keep Hikaleo and ELP in there. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't mind that. They're developing into quite a team. So uh, either way, uh, we're just looking for a good matchup. Yeah, I, I expect us to be talking very highly about this match after it's all said and done. Next one, Shoto Umino and Jack Perry. So uh, we're supposing here that uh, this goes to Umino and it wraps up that story for now, unless they want to carry it over to Forbidden Door. We're leaning toward Umino just because we have a feeling that Jack Perry is going to be part of the whole Young Bucks FTR thing and might be in something else when it comes to uh, Forbidden Door. So we think this is Shota finally getting his victory here and, and moving on to other things. Uh, but, you know, with Shoto Mina, you never know. They like to cut him off at the knees. <laughs> I think Shoto's winning this, and I think they have a plan for him after. Mm. And I'm going to get to that later on. <laughs> yeah, uh, and, and, and I agree with you on that, but you can never discount Shoto losing no. a big match. <laughs> no, absolutely not. Uh, you can't, you okay. can't discount it. We, are, we talked about this in January. We've talked about him week after week for the last three months. What's your grade of Jack Perry? What grade do you give him for his New Japan run for the last three months? Oh, I think it's been good. I think he's done a good job. I think it's. I think he's. I think he's done well with this. Uh, I thought his attitude uh, and the way he presented himself right there is, was was good. I, I enjoyed I his run. To learn and and take in new knowledge and just be a goon in House of Torture. I thought it was all great. He just showed a great attitude. Better than him as a heel in AEW right there. I think he's, right. I think he's picked up on some things and, and has developed that because he really hadn't been a heel in his entire career. Right. I mean, jungle boy was never a, heel. the jungle boy character was never a heel. So uh, he's picked up some valuable experience with that. And it's clear that the guys, we know he's physically talented. He can wrestle. Uh, the issue has always been a little bit on some of that emotional projection and the charisma thing. Mm -hmm. And sometimes going heel is exactly what you need to bring that out. Yeah. Yeah. So, been good. I've been really impressed and uh, hope to see more of it. Yeah, and of course, as as Venkin is mentioning right here, there is no bigger heel in wrestling in terms of Chicago in Chicago than Jack Perry. Oh, so, you can uh, be hated. Yes, hated. he is. And he also mentions that he's selling a lot of merch. Yeah, that's been pretty good. Sold out of his merch. There you go. So, uh, yeah, I, I, all in all, just an improvement. Sometimes that heel turns exactly what the guy needs. Yeah, so Hiromu is. Takahashi will face Mustafa Ali. We are still – I'm waiting to hear a pre-match promo or something at the press conference, perhaps, where the X Division gets thrown into this. Because I've been mentioning it too much for it not to be a title match, but it's not listed as a title match right now. So that could uh, either go on the press conference or there could be something, uh, you know, pre-match here. Uh and and Daryl was in Chicago, by the way. I hey. believe we, we saw him in the in bed at the hotel, uh, in Hiromu's bed at the hotel. Daryl and his mask uh, sleeping there. We brought Daryl back apparently for this. Well, I had a conversation with Mike Gilbert about WrestleMania. And we did talk about Windy City, and he is, you know, very attuned to TNA wrestling, sure. where Mustafa Ali is there, 
And we came to the conclusion that we kind of thought that Hiromu would win this and then challenge potentially for the X division title over in TNA. And there you go. That sounds like a lot of fun. They could do something else, but when you're really just kind of putting it all together and see what's best for business, that, that kind of sounds like a great formula. Yeah, and they could absolutely put Hiromu over here and then do the title match in TNA. That would help everybody. Uh, so that's always a possibility. And, and like Lincoln says, if they do it for the title, I think Ali retains. I don't see much point in Hiromu holding the X Division title for best of the Super Juniors too much. I don't see how that helps TNA. Doesn't mean they won't do it. I just don't see how it helps TNA. So, In the middle of our show, I had a crazy fucking idea about this match. The Eddie Kingston and Gabe Kidd match? So that is a Mystery Vortex style match here. We have Eddie Kingston and Gabe Kidd. It's a tornado match. It's going to be chaos. It's one of these things where it's four men on a side. They're probably going to fight all through the arena. This is going to be that match on the show, the hardcore style match. Eddie Kingston and three guys, Gabe Kidd and three guys. We won't know who those other six are until tomorrow night officially. So with that in mind, go ahead and tell us your theory. I can't believe I'm even saying this out loud. And no, not Osprey. But what if it's Adam fucking Copeland as one of his partners in this match? <laughs> so, yeah, Adam I, Copeland I, and Mark Briscoe as his partners. It's two of the partners. Yeah, I mean, it could be. I mean, I, I, they have the trio match uh, coming up at, or he has the match at Dynasty and they have their Cook Man match coming up. You know that they love to pop crowds. You, if they if a guy like that came out, New Japan would go nuts. It would be like the headline. I don't think it'll happen. But in the middle of our conversation, I was like, I need to wonder if Adam Copeland, given how much he loves just what he's doing right now, is just gonna show up on a Friday night in New Japan and just wrestle a match. I do think Mark Briscoe is gonna be in this, don't you? Yeah, that's why I was yeah. okay with like suggesting Adam Copeland. Yeah, yeah, I I think it's Briscoe. You're right about Copeland. That's not as I feel really good about Briscoe. Copeland's right. an interesting idea. I, I yeah. Any any idea on who might be on kid's side? I would just assume War Dogs. You know, like Finley is gonna be there, but he's not booked for a match. But there's he's advertised uh, for it. But there has to be a surprise, right? Otherwise, don't you just announce the War Dogs versus Eddie and? three mystery partners. You know what I mean? Like they, they do the mystery partner thing all the time. If it's saying it's like, if you have the war dogs and they're like, oh, da, 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 and then all of a sudden you have somebody like Copeland that comes out, like you have TJP and then you have Mark Briscoe. And then all of a sudden Adam Copeland comes out. Mm. And, and it just happens to be that way. Cause TJP wants to get his hands on whatever. And then they do this angle. This is just one thing. And you know, as I'm saying it, I see plenty of, like holes in this logic, but Ortiz was injured. You could yeah. do homicide, but at what point do you bring in people that you're just like, oh my god, oh my god, oh my god, rather mm -hmm. than like, oh that's cool. Yeah, yeah. The Briscoes have been in, uh, well, you know, the Briscoes have been part of uh, New Japan before. Of course, they've been uh, part of the big tag team scene there. So uh, having Mark back would be would be pretty cool. Uh, and oh, and Venkin mentions Kenta and Lance Archer as possibilities for this match somewhere in there. Sure, Lance yeah, I mean, be a good one. yeah, it'd be good. That'd be a good choice. I'm more curious because uh, I think you're onto something with 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 Briscoe and maybe Copeland if they can get him. And they maybe they asked and maybe they didn't. You know, but uh, I'm very curious as to who comes out with Kid. I don't think it's all necessarily the usual war dog. I think some of them will be. But uh, I don't I don't know if it's all just traditional war dogs. I think there might be one guy like, oh damn him. There's another part of this. Do you think it's weird that they just put him right into the never open weight title scene when this whole feud over the strong title is unresolved? Yeah, I mean a little bit, but right now the the booking with the titles has been so chaotic. I mean, at which I mean, you Yuya Uemura is going after a couple of different things. At sure. Once. So uh, that, that many mouths, is, not that many mouths to feed, but many titles to put on waste. <laughs> and Kid has been involved with multiple people for half a year now. Remember, he Osprey. Uh, he went after mm -hmm. Eddie. He's gone after these. Like he has been the madman that'll just fight anyone. And he has, you know, he had the thing with Osprey where he got hurt. Remember, that was supposed to be a sure. match with him. So it's not unusual for Kid to have, uh, to be fighting wars on multiple fronts. 
they've been doing that with his character for uh, months and months now. It is entirely possible that this does end up with a match at resurgence for the title. Sure. And they move forward. But I really thought putting the title on him would be a great idea. But if it could, the choice between the strong open weight and the never open weight title, you know, I'm going to pick the never open weight title. <laughs> Well, it's two very different things that will come up. He and Eddie will have a great, great brawl. There's just mm -hmm. no question about that. He and Shingo will have a really exciting, violent, stiff wrestling. You put both belts match. on him? No, but I, I, I wouldn't be surprised if he got one or the other. I mean, I, yeah. I, I think they're going to sure. put, I think they're going to put a title on Gabe because I think they take Gabe very seriously as a, a big time heel talent. Uh, but you're right about him eventually being a babyface. But I think he's going to be a pushed heel. First, sure. Well, you know that's uh, I don't think you'll get both, but I could definitely see him getting one or the one or the other. So, and it, it all depends on what they have with Eddie. I mean, the, the, is does New Japan are they going to have Eddie going forward? You know, there's always I don't that. Think so yeah, I, so I, I mean, it might be I mean time he's only doing domestic shows, and they're getting all the belts off of him mm -hmm. real quick. So, I think I think we're not long for Eddie Kingston, New Japan Strong Champion, but he could come and go as he pleases without mm -hmm. having a belt and probably be better for him where he could just come in and feud as he here and there. If you wanted to turn Gabe kid baby face, and I'm not saying they do, but if he did, you could have him look like he's about to ascend to the leadership of the bullet club and then have David Finlay kick him out. Yeah. Gets, Finlay, gets Finlay over as the asshole. And then, you know, you get kid as the baby Brutus. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, or, or to cut him off before he can, like, you know, like he's so paranoid that any threat to him gets uh, erased immediately. That type of thing. Matt Riddle and Zack Sabre Jr. For the television title. I think bigger plans are ahead for Zach. So I don't see him winning this back here. Uh, although, uh, as a fan, I will be rooting for Zach. <laughs> I, I, I will too. I'll be rooting for Zach. I feel like this match is to legitimize Matt Riddle yeah. within the New Japan ecosphere. Yeah. And that's fine. Um, I hope I'll be really impressed with this match, but that's really all my expectations are. Yeah. I, you know what? And <laughs> Vankin says, let's face it, we shouldn't have this match. Yeah. I kind of agree with you. Uh, I would, I'd rather not see Matt Riddle at all. Next, we have Nick Nemeth and uh, Tomohiro Ishii, uh, which is not for the global title. We've talked about that. He wants his first defense to be against Hiroshi Tanahashi. This feels like a match that Nemeth, uh, the idea here, Jeremy, to have a good match, Nemeth can win. Yeah. I don't have much to add to this. I'm really underwhelmed by the presence of Nemeth in New Japan uh, this year so far. So I'm trying to keep my mouth shut until I see more of his work within New Japan so I can actually have an opinion about his work in New Japan because as I'm trying to hint, he's barely been here. <laughs> and uh, Ishi, and he's, I, I think he only really has one more match left yeah. or one or two. So, and then Ishii, of course, is bulletproof. He can lose and the fans... He's take made of stone, you mean? Yeah, he's got another one coming up at... Uh, Come, uh, coming up uh, soon that's going to be uh, great at the uh, All Together Again thing, which we'll get to. And, of course... Tetsuya Naito, John Moxley for the IWGP heavyweight title. Uh, oh, Sam is here from the Power Bombshells, our siblings. Uh, sibling show, popping in real quick to say welcome to the 100 episode club. And Thanks, Sam. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sam. We appreciate it. We're glad you're back. And uh, by the way, make sure you go and check their show, 1 p.m. Eastern. The Power Bombshells every Sunday. Power Bombshells. Yeah, the last Sunday was uh, was a, was a really good uh, episode. They have a lot of a lot of things to say about everything that's been going on in uh, wrestling across the the world of it. Uh, they they cover all the different. Uh, aspects of it wwe aew ring of honor gc all of it and uh some important things to say so make sure you check them out uh but yeah naito and moxley you can make a case either way can't you jeremy because we've talked about this one naito is your biggest drawing card in japan right now and if these crowds weren't as strong as they were for his title matches i would feel like this is a chance to put it on moxley maybe and have Moxley come in for the big shows, which he's willing to do. You know, he could he could come over for Dominion. He could come over for these things and, and go into, I don't think he would be in the G1, but you could have the champion kind of watching the G1 from afar. Uh, you could do that. You could do all those things and have Moxley be the, uh, the guy that comes in for the big shows. I would feel better about that if Naito weren't drawing bigger crowds in Japan right now. And so business-wise, 
it might be too tempting to keep it on Naito, but boy, they have been very careful about Moxley's wins and losses ever since his, his G1. So doesn't do a lot of losing. Naito doesn't do a lot of losing either, and he's the biggest drawing card. I'm really torn on who ends up with the belt out of this because you could do it. You could do it. Uh, but you could also have Naito retain and try to get that baseball stadium show eventually, and uh, there's a lot going on there. Nobody would be surprised if Naito retained, right? But I think if you've been watching New Japan for a long period of time, you know that the tape around this knee has gotten a little bit bigger. The mm-hmm. surgery at his eyes has happened a few more times over the years. The amount of bumps that that guy can take and the amount of big matches that he is able to provide and and do. like you got to remember that G1 last year. He wasn't exactly going hard the entire way. You know, there came a point near the end of that schedule where it's like, all right, everyone's done their work getting their cells, getting themselves over, so it's time to do the service to get Naito over. And he had a few matches near the end, and then he was able to have a really light schedule until Wrestle Kingdom. Like, that was, that was the formula. I'm not sure how many more big matches he has this year. So if he's going to lose to a guy, you got to lose to a guy who's made. Because, like... Having Naito, not having the confidence of having Naito lose to a guy that they're not sure is made yet is is going to be very difficult for New Japan to bounce back from. If you have someone beat Moxley and it's a fluke, it's a lot different than beating Naito as a fluke and then having the rest of New Japan chasing them. So I'm kind of leaning toward Moxley getting the title for a while and then setting the stage of whoever takes the title from him and then being a chase of all the top stars going after that individual. They could do Naito, and they could have the guy being made by beating Naito. I'm just not sure if you want to make sure he's protected going forward because you don't have Tanahashi at that level, and you don't have Okada, and you don't have Osprey. And so if you're going to make sure that a guy is bulletproof, you got to make sure Naito's bulletproof, and that means protecting him even through like navigating a title, getting the title off of him. So I'm heavily leaning toward Moxley here. I'm heavily, heavily leaning. But if we're to talk tomorrow night and I have to eat a bag of S saying like, oh yeah, night of one, like, I totally get it too. But if it were me, I think I think Moxley is the guy, despite the many, many arguments about how it's not going to help New Japan long term. And, and and whoever goes into G1 as the champion is probably going to be headlining the Tokyo Dome. We know the G1 champion headlines Tokyo Dome. That's the whole point. Right. But whoever has the belt going into the G1 usually does. Now they have done a little switch. Remember they did with Jay White and Kota Ibushi, but both of those guys ended up as part of that two night tournament thing. So Mm -hmm. you have to look at, okay, if Moxley wins the title at Windy City Riot, he can defend it. He could defend it at Duntaku. He could defend it at Dominion. You could take it off of him there, but doing a couple of title changes in quick succession isn't normally New Japan style. I'm not saying it's impossible, but it's not normally their style. So if Moxley wins it, he probably, if you go over there, goes into the whole thing. Now, Moxley is a foreigner that could headline a Wrestle King. Yes. He, he is a star there. Yes. So another reason why you might go ahead and do that. The thing is, Naito is your biggest ticket seller so that would immediately make him the favorite so to speak for the g1 this year to put it back and run it back at the Mm -hmm, tokyo dome mm -hmm. you absolutely could do that my question is do you do the story of naito chasing the title two years in a row at the dome or do you try to have naito who can carry almost anybody else in the main event coming out of that g1 as long as they don't put some schmuck in there uh, you know, you can do Naito and the G1 winner. You know, these are the things that they have to kind of decide. And you have to be thinking about Wrestle Kingdom now. I'm sure they are. They probably thought about Wrestle mm-hmm. Kingdom on January 5th, you know, the, the this year. But those are the where the scales are. You know, you have to think, well, you can do Moxley. You could, absolutely could. Uh, but right now it has to be tempting because, boy, Naito's selling tickets. And that's how New Japan makes its money. It's not TV contracts. It is merchandise, but it's also ticket sales. And Naito is drawing strong crowds for his title matches. And taking that away might be a difficult sell to the Bushy Road team. So that's, that's yeah. 
at some point in the run to Wrestle Kingdom through the G1, Naito, whoever wins the G1, even if it's Naito, like if it's not Naito, whoever ha- win it will have to go through Naito before Wrestle Kingdom in some way, shape, or form. And like the semis, the finals, in a random one off match, he's the ultimate gatekeeper of legitimacy towards the guy to the next level right now. Mm-hmm. And even if a guy won the G1, I think it's the year where I think it's in fact the kind of year where they would lean towards winning the G1 and then losing a Wrestle Kingdom. Like I would not rule that out with the crop of young talent and their ability to just like downshift on how quickly they want to move with this thing. There's a lot they can do, but they have to carefully eliminate Naito from the equation of the title scene without absolutely ruining what he has left for the crowd. You know, it's 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 an interesting thing because you know Naito can still turn it on for big matches and things. So it's it's yeah. I mean, taking away your biggest ticket seller, or not taking him away, but taking the belt off your biggest ticket seller is is. A gutsy call. I'm not saying they Absolutely. won't do it, but it's a, it's a gutsy. They did it last year. They did it with Sonata, and I. But the problem is, you know, <laughs> that didn't work. So <laughs> that was another uh, thing in uh, Naito's favor. They might just go, For the love of God, let's not do that again. Uh, not that I'm trying to say that Moxley and Sonata are the same thing, but a guy who's not on the circuit, not on the, you know, again, biggest ticket seller. It's a big deal for them. So, what are the chances that Moxley wins this match? And then after in his post-match celebration, someone comes out to challenge him. I feel like this is the opportunity for the crowd to go wild that Shota Umino challenges him for the title. Especially since you just had Naito and Yoda Suji. It would be a mirror image kind of match. Do you do that match? Do you do it at Dominion? Do you do it at Dentaku? I feel like if, if Moxley wins, and I think the next match would probably be Dominion. You know, like I, I don't know, yeah. Dantaku probably headlined with a never thing or something like that. Uh, and Benkin mentions just Sonata. Well, he also, he, I don't know if he can do Dantaku and Resurgence because Moxley will be at Resurgence. Yeah, but they also said that the IWGP champion will be at Resurgence. They also said that Naito will be there, so they yeah. kept it intentionally ambiguous. Yeah. You could do Shota versus Moxley at Resurgence, but I also kind of think. That's a Dominion match, especially since Yoda and Sonata had their match at Dominion last year. And doing the next year with one of those young Rewa in the main yeah. event again just seems yeah. like the the way to go. I don't yeah, know. I'm, yeah. just, I'm thinking all of this out, and I feel like Moxley and Shota is going to get a lot of people very interested. And Benkin mentions, does Sonata get the pops Moxley gets? I'm not trying to say that putting the belt on Moxley is the same as putting it on Sonata. That, uh no, he does. Sonata does not get the pops that Moxley gets. Moxley is much more popular in that sense. Uh, I'm just saying, and I also, like I said, I think Moxley is a guy that could headline the Tokyo Dome. Uh, but I also think that if Moxley headlines the Tokyo Dome, and again, we have to think about that because if, if you get to G1, you're probably going to go to the Dome with it. Mm-hmm. Uh, the and that's not as far off as it feels, <laughs> you know, that's not all that far off. Uh, I just keep game playing this in my head. And he, Moxley would still need a huge New Japan name to sell Wrestle Kingdom. It, it can't just be Moxley and or somebody. someone that he's tied to that will have people interested because they're invested in the story. Right. Yeah. So you could do it with Moxley in a way that I don't think it would work with other. The people. only other person that you can really do at that level right now is that Saber Junior. Frankly speaking, because everyone else is gone. But Zach and Moxley isn't. But Zach and Moxley is not a Tokyo Dome main event. Naito and Zach could be. Yes. Could so be. you know, it's just it's a tough. Huh, I don't know who's going to win this thing, which I guess makes this show more exciting, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Speaking of another show, we got the wrestling world. We got to power through all this stuff. So. Yeah, you're right. Wrestling World 2024 in Taiwan. This is Sunday again. Uh, so we have a match from the Puzzle Promotion. That's uh, Toy Yu against uh, Ax Wang. I'm not familiar with either one of these. Guys. I know sorry. zero about either of these guys. We'll be recapping it next Thursday. The Never Open Way Title Tournament, the sixth of the trios title. Uh, so Tanahashi, Yano, and Bolton against Great Okan, Akira, and Newman. 
And then the LIJ crew, Shingo, Suji, and Bushi against Sho, Evil, and Kanemaru, uh, with the winners facing off for the title a little bit later. An IWGT GP tag team title match, Bishamon versus Sonata and Uemura. That should be a really good match, by the way. That should be good. Yeah. Satoshi Kojima and Tiger Mask against El Desperado and Shoma Kato. Okay. Interesting. Uh, Hanako against Starlight Kid. There's there's your stardom match. Uh, Starlight Kid was in WrestleMania with a lot of the stardom women uh, in the crowd. They just uh, bought their tickets, apparently, or and uh, watched from the from, watched from the seats. Doki against Kosei Fujita. And then, of That'll course, the, the, it will be good. And the winner there gets the shot at show. And then uh, the never open way to uh, six man tournament finals. So, uh, yeah, it, it should be a decent uh, card. And uh, and uh, you know, it's an interesting thing for. For Taiwan, trying to expand their market out there. So I think everyone will work hard. Probably be an interesting night. Yeah, I mean, I'll be glad that we get the recap. And then we actually have content to talk about next Thursday with mm -hmm. that whole show as well. Are you going to wait for the English or are you just going to try and power through with the Japanese? No, I'll watch uh, the Japanese. I don't mind the Japanese commentary. You know, uh, I, my, my wife's out of town from Friday to Wednesday. I'm so excited. I'm going to watch all the stuff. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. And uh, Venkin mentions that they all probably wanted to watch EO, probably. Yeah. I think so. Well, you know, Evil flew out. He flew out to the show. He went to Mania. Who did? Evil. Oh, I, I, he, I was saying that they, the, the stardom win wanted to see EO. I know. Uh, and Scott. I thought, speaking of EO, Evil flew out. Oh, to Mania. I see. To see. see EO. <laughs> no, okay. Well, the the whole the whole thing too, on uh, which I which I saw, which like uh oh, was uh, a lot of the tweets from the women in the the crowd. You know, they would take a picture of the ring and the set and everything else, and they're doing selfies with it. And it's a lot of them. Hmm, I wonder what the view from that ring is. You know, like yeah. You know, <laughs> once you get a taste of that, boy, rest, WWE contract starts looking real good after you've been to WrestleMania, right there. Uh, new matches added to all together. We have uh, Kai and Sonata. So Kai is a wrestler from Dragon Gate uh, and uh, with Sonata facing Chris Brooks and Zack Sabre Jr. Some ties for these guys. Kai and Sonata uh, go all the way back to their Wrestle 1 days. And, of course, Zack and Brooks are both uh, from the British scene. So, And then uh, Keno against Kosei Fujita in a uh, special singles match there. So uh, those two have been added to uh, all together. And we will be looking at that more as it approaches. Another Tamashi show has been announced for May 17th and May 18th. Those don't typically end up on New Japan World, so I don't know if we'll see them or not. And then we got the Death Bay Invitational right after Dominion. It's another <laughs> Mystery Vortex show. I'm here for it. Basically, Death Bay is booking the show. Yeah. So it, this is very similar to some of the Hiromu Takahashi book shows there where uh, this one's Death Bay. And, uh, Definitely a cool vibe, style. though. <laughs> <laughs> it's got a cool poster, that's for sure. Absolutely. And then... Uh, yeah, so that's coming up uh, just uh, June 10th at Corican Halls when uh, that well, one's Well, Dominion is June 9th, so it's like back-to-back. -back, so that's cool. cool yeah, that's right. And then uh, we got Dominion the Best of Super Junior announcement, and then we'll talk about Akibono and such. So let's look at the people that are in the Super Juniors officially. Ryusuke Taguchi. Oh, show. The, yeah, go ahead. I'll go with your uh, graphics there. Hiromu Takahashi, one of the favorites. Uh, four of the last five, right? He's won four of the last five. The last so. three, I think. And Ryusuke Taguchi, again, like I said, he'll be in it. Desperado, another one of the favorites, certainly. Uh, good news here. Kevin Knight from the Jet Setters will be there. That's always great. Uh, well, Yo is Maybe. still listed as of now. Maybe we'll see how the shoulder uh, reacts. They he might was announced to on the show that he was injured. It was a pre-packaged video. Yeah. At any point, we could find out that Yo is not in this match yeah. or in this tournament. Bushi. There it is. Uh, by the way, I found out Bushi means warrior in Japanese this past week. So that's what that Bushi Road, Warrior Road, Bushi, just warrior. Oh, I never made that connection. I feel really dumb right now. No, no, I just, uh, I'm learning Japanese with uh, Duolingo. So that they went to Bushi. How's that uh, working out? Is, that, is, it, uh, is it working? Yeah, I think, I, I think I'm doing okay. I mean, I, I'm, I'm getting Bushi. ready. I'm, going, I'm trying to go back next year. The goal is to go back to Japan next year. I'm not going to be fluent. I know that, but I just at least want to talk to some people and get around a little bit. And yeah, it's not hard. Everything's in English. You, you're fine. Sure. Uh, but uh, just I want to challenge myself, maybe talk to some people. Wow. What a bit of growth for you, Stephen Conway. I'm so proud. Teton from CMLL will be there. Uh, TJP. And we'll see if there's any angles with him. So will the Nova Fireball, Francesco Akira. Doki will be there. Oh, Sam! Sam's saying that uh, his, her sister Nikki uses Duolingo to learn Japanese as well. I, I'm totally into the idea. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm, do, I'm you know, doing I'm Spanish. Lazy. 
I'm doing Spanish on Rosetta Stone, and then I do uh, Duolingo for Japanese. So I'm, no, I'm, I'm incredibly doing. lazy. I've not done either. And I'm <laughs> Robbie Eagles back for TMDK. I'm excited about that. I haven't seen Robbie yeah. in a while. Uh, the Bone Soldier Taiji Ishimori. Uh, Yoshinobu Kanemaru. And Clark Connors. Da, Drilla Maloney will be there, of course. And then uh, we have some debuts. So uh, Kosei Fujita making his uh, debut in Super Juniors. Very cool. And then all heat, we have uh, Blake Christian. So that is uh, that is a uh, – he's from Ring of Honor, of course. It is his first one in uh, – it's his debut also. A in the New debut. Japan strong veteran. Yeah. Very much around on those shows before. And then here are the two Noah guys. We talked a little bit to Justin Nipper about this. Uh, so we have uh, Ninja Mac and Hayata. So, you know, that it was some fresh faces, some fresh matches. Yeah. I'm enthusiastic about it. I, looking at this, we'll have to see the blocks before we really can do a lot in the prediction sure. phase. Hiromo and Desperado, to me, are uh, the obvious ones. And then, of course, uh, TJP, depending on what angle they're running. I think it's he's either going to have a huge tournament where he either wins or almost wins, or it's going to be one of those deals where he bombs out to further his storyline of not making Great Ocon and Jeff Cobb happy. But something... Or it's going to be a, he a has, tournament he ends of up blaming other people for his failures. Wink, wink. Yes, yeah, there could be something like that. There's going to be an angle, I think, coming out of this with TJP regarding the uh, the whole United Empire situation. So I think he's got more of a storyline tournament coming. I also think Taiji Ishimori could get a bit of a run here, but maybe I just say that every year because I like him a lot. <laughs> so I, I don't know. Uh, and uh, Colin mentions this. There's no Speedball or Leo Rush this year. Yeah, I, I was really hoping to see Speedball again too, but I guess the schedules don't quite... Uh, allow it that's a but, lot of time to give away and they're focusing on him a lot in tna right now yeah, who could blame him man that guy's ridiculously talented that i tell you that zach saber match i saw in garland texas is mm -hmm. one of the best matches i've seen live i saw Hart versus austin i quit so that one's going to hold the the that crown for a very long time but uh that speedball zach match was just brilliant i, I hope we get more of him before we get to the Akabono, just best wishes to Osamu Nishimura. Yeah. Uh, one of the tweaks that I did explaining his uh, significance is he, uh, his match with Takayama in the 2002 G1, for example, is one of the things that he's best known for. So there he's go. going yeah. through it, and we wish the best for him. Yeah, and Sam says, I was really hoping for Mustafa Ali. I guess there's hope for the G1. Uh, he's going to be over as hell, by the way. He's a Chicago yeah. guy. And uh, We were thinking you know, he might uh, be defending that TNA uh, X Division title uh, against Romo uh, at some point in, over there. But, you know, like this to, year with the best of the Super Juniors, I just don't think that TNA has given up people for that big period of time. Yeah, and the other side of that, uh, Resurgence could be a Mustafa yeah. Ali match in, in New Japan of some kind. That'd be, uh, that'd be great, too. I like that when he was in WWE, I thought he was fabulous. You know, it's, I mean, that's not exactly a secret that he's really, really good. I'm just glad people are starting to realize it. I'm still debating whether I should drive down there. I tried to talk to Dave and said, Hey, you want to take a road trip? And he did not say no. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe he'll go. A long road trip. Dave on a road trip to Ontario. Not Canada. the same thing. Not Canada, Stephen. <laughs> All right, look. Let's talk about Octoboto. <laughs> Fine. Akebono. So, uh, yeah, Akebono passed away uh, really late last night uh, in the United States time out there. He is a, uh, well, uh, there's a lot. Now, you could go through weeks of a podcast talking about his uh, history with sumo wrestling, but Akebono, his real name's Chad Rowan. He's Hawaiian. He's American. He is uh, the first non-Japanese to ascend to the Yokozuna level in sumo wrestling. So this was a, a very big deal at the time. Uh, there were a lot of talks that nobody but Japanese could ever be a Yokozuna. That's changed now. The last several have been Mongolian. But uh, at the time, this was a monster deal that somebody who wasn't Japanese could become a Yokozuna. Now, sumo was mostly a meritocracy as far as moving up through the various levels, uh, you know, through uh, the ranks, so to speak. If you have a winning record, you move up. If you have a losing record, you move down. There you go. Uh, the Yokozuna thing, though, uh, that's an Ozeki getting promoted to Yokozuna. 
not necessarily a meritocracy. You have to be a grand champion, of course, and win top level tournaments in order to do it mostly. Uh, but uh, it's a situation where there are certain intangibles. And for a long time, people felt that only Japanese people had those intangibles to be a Yokozuna. So a little bit of nationalism uh, crept in there, but he was undeniable. And also at the time he came up during a time when there were no active Yokozuna, which drives everybody nuts when that happens. So Akebono became the first one. He was enormous, Jeremy. He was six mm -hmm. foot eight in most of his career, over 500 pounds, just enormous. And uh, at first he got over just by basically sheer size. Uh, but once he put his technique together, this guy was a steamroller. And uh, he uh, ended up winning uh, 11 tournaments and was a runner up 13 times. So he was one of the most successful. And uh, like I said, you could go through a, a whole podcast series on his sumo career and his uh, rivalry with uh, Takano Hano and Wakano Hana. But this is a New Japan podcast. We're going to get into his pro wrestling career, which took place after he had gone through a series of injuries and had to get out of sumo. Just, you know, <laughs> being six foot eight and 500 pounds, not good for the joints either. So he eventually had to leave sumo right there. And uh, it was a situation where he tried to run a restaurant after his career, went into some business deals that didn't go so well, ended up having to make some money. He got into... MMA and kickboxing. Now, at this time, this very early 2000s, K1 kickboxing was a huge sport in Japan. The K1 Grand Prix was one of the biggest uh, martial arts combat sports events in all of Japan. He went in right into K1 against Bob Sapp, another guy who wrestled in a little bit. Uh, and uh, yeah, well, Colin, we're going to get into that in just a second. But it's a uh, yeah, Ake Bono ended up going into that, and he did a New Year's Day fight with Bob Sapp that was one of the most watched events in the history of Japanese television. It was that big of a deal. 54 million people watched that fight. Ake Bono ended up losing it. Uh, in fact, he wasn't that successful outside of sumo and combat sports. And to give you an idea, he was 0-4 in MMA and 1-9 and in kickboxing. So... Uh, you know, that, that one didn't pan out so great there. And he was taking a lot of beatings and, uh, he ended up getting into professional wrestling. So, uh, that was one way where you can at least, uh, you know, work with somebody instead of having somebody just, uh, flat out trying to, trying to hurt you. So in, uh, one of the more silly ideas in WWE history, they presented the big show as a possible sumo wrestler and brought in Ake Bono for WrestleMania 21 to face the big show in a sumo wrestling match. Uh, so they tried to pass that off. They, a worked sumo wrestling match looks horrible. But nevertheless, they uh, pulled it off, and of course he won that. Uh, but he started doing actual wrestling matches instead of worked sumo matches. So uh, he, uh, by the way, he, he ended up uh, teaming up with Big Show later to beat Carlito and Matt Morgan, if you remember those guys. Uh, well, certainly remember Carlito, but Matt Morgan thinks he eventually went to all Japan and started there with another huge match. Keep in mind, if you're a Yokozuna and especially a wildly successful one, and he was Yokozuna for eight years, which is a long time to be active as a Yokozuna. You're one of the most famous people in Japan, sports, entertainment, anything otherwise. Uh, so you're one of the most famous people. And again, six foot eight, 500 pounds, you stand out. So he was a monster draw immediately. So he started with a huge match, Wrestle One event uh, against the Great Muta. Uh, so he wrestled the Great Muta. Now, of course, it was Kaiji Muto booking this, so Muta won. Uh, but <laughs> that kicked off All Japan's Grand Prix. Uh, after that, though, he started, uh, he, he became Muto's enforcer and tag team partner. Uh, they went to the finals of the Rural World Tag League in 2005, where they were beaten by the Dudleys in that one. And Tokyo Sports named him Rookie of the Year and Tag Team of the Year, not so much for his ability, but for his drawing power and just the fact that he was a monster star. And yeah, Venkin, he says, uh, didn't they remove the ropes for that match? Yes, they, they tried to make it look like a sumo uh, ring a little bit. The ring posts were still there. He can't get around that. But they took the ropes down. He eventually won by throwing Big Show completely out of the ring altogether and splattered to the floor. That was how they worked a sumo match. So he debuted with uh, All Japan. 
And uh, he also worked a little bit for Noah, but he debuted for New Japan in 2006 on the January 4th show. It wasn't called Wrestle Kingdom yet, but uh, he teamed with Yutaka Yoshi uh, against the Black Strong Machine, who was Junji Hirata, and Hiro Saito. Uh, and then most companies recognized that he had this name value. He had a little, he had charisma. Uh, and certainly was famous, but he needed to be in a tag team to carry the load for him. So he was almost always in tag team matches uh, early on. And that's how it went when he joined the New Japan roster. He teamed with Ricky Choshu. So uh, he teamed a little bit with uh, Tiger Mask when he was still in his uh, prime, the current Tiger Mask, uh, against uh, Giant Bernard and the Black Tiger, who was Rocky Romero at the time. Uh, other partners were Yuji Nagata, Satoshi Kojima, Hiroshi Tanahashi. So you get the idea that he was in with the biggest stars in New Japan at the time and against some of the biggest heels, Tenzan, Chono, all those guys. Uh, so he worked the full schedule and having a star like Akebono on the cards was a draw as they went around the house show circuit. He bumped up crowds uh, around uh, the, even in the small town. So he, he worked a full schedule, worked a lot of matches. Uh, his first New Japan singles match was March 19th in 2006, challenging Brock Lesnar for the IWGP title, and he lost, but he didn't lose clean. Uh, Lesnar hit him with the title belt, so they, they protected him there a little bit. Uh, Lesnar vacated the title soon after. Akebono entered the tournament to crown a new champion, uh, so he got his first singles win in New Japan in that tournament, beating Hiroyoshi Tenzan, but then he lost to Giant Bernard in the semifinal, and Tanahashi beat Bernard in the finals. So that was it there. And he went 31 and 18 in his first year in New Japan. He was in the 2007 G1 tournament, finished in the middle of the pack there. And then he began working for everybody else. And I mean everybody else. He started working for all the different companies. So he spent 2006, 2007 with New Japan and basically became a free agent. Everywhere he went, he would do a match here and there, like a special attraction, almost like what Andre the Giant did in the territory days. Uh, Andre would sometimes just do an entire loop around a territory, but Akebono was more for big shows only. So he would kind of come in as a special attraction match and then, uh, you know, go away. But he worked for All Japan, Dragon Gate, Osaka Pro, Zero One. Uh, not a whole lot for Noah, but a little bit for Noah. And he would come in for... Uh, here's a good example. In 2013, he wrestled at Wrestle Kingdom 7, the Invasion Attack show, and then a special tag match during the G1 uh, tournament. So it, it would be like that. He would just kind of dink and dunk. And then in the whole time, he would go and work for other people right there uh, around at their big shows as well. And he would do a Blue Justice show for Yuji Nagata. He would be brought in as a special attraction for that special thing. So his final match in uh, New Japan were, uh, it was Akebono, uh, Kazushi Sakuraba, and Kota Ibushi teaming up to face Taka Takashi Izuka, if you remember him with the, the Iron Fingers, Tomohiro Ishii, and Yoshihashi. So that was in his final match for New Japan in 2013. And he made these special appearances here and there until uh, 2017 when his health really began to fail. And uh we heard that he was in a wheelchair and Dave Meltzer mentioned today as he was talking about it on wrestling observer radio, that he even had dementia and he was only 54 years old. So um, I got an unfortunate end there for Chad Rowan, Akebono there, but somebody that had an impact because they would bring him in as a special attraction. He'd pop a crowd, he'd pop a rating for new Japan. So it was somebody that they used, um, like I said, mostly on those big shows and he had a bit of a run in tag team. So they knew that, you know, put him in a tag team, put him with a good worker, have them do most of the match and have Ake Bono come in and do a couple of key spots. And that was the best way to use him. So very similar. And uh, Venkin had a question here. He said, I have a question involving Yokozuna. How is it determined uh, by years? Can you drop that title after a while and be like, I don't want to be Yokozuna anymore. And uh, Colin has a correct here. He said, no, you're Yokozuna until you retire. And the key is that's one thing uh, from Ozeki. You can be demoted if you have a losing record mm -hmm. from anywhere right. else. Yokozuna, but there is fierce pressure on a Yokozuna to not be a losing wrestler. If you can't be at the top of the tournaments, you are sort of expected to retire right, rather right. than go five and 10 in a 15 match tournament. You're just not supposed to do that as a Yokozuna. And you will see if guys are not at peak form, they will withdraw from a tournament with an injury 
rather than go through a whole tournament with a losing record and you mm-hmm. know come back strong. That's what we're running into with the current Yokozuna uh, Tenro Fuji, who's struggling uh, with injury. When he wrestles an entire tournament, he's right up there toward the top. Uh, but if he's not at his best, uh, and if he's a little bit injured, he tends to do one or two matches and then withdraw. So that's a, a thing that we've seen with him. And that's what happened to him. Uh, he eventually just realized that his body just wasn't going to let him uh, compete for the championships. And so he uh, stepped down. Because you're expected to do that as Yokozuna. You're not supposed to be a losing Yokozuna. That's not so good. But they can't take it away from you either. Well, they, you know what? That's not even true. I was, I was just about to think. That's well, not actually. even true. Yeah. <laughs> He's not even the first Yokozuna that's been a professional wrestler because uh, Koji Katao was Koji Katao was promoted to Yokozuna without he's the, been the exception to every rule. Koji Katao, <laughs> he was he was promoted to Yokozuna without winning a major tournament. And then once he got there, he caused so many issues. They actually kicked him out of sumo as a Yokozuna. And he ended up in pro wrestling where he caused a hell of a lot of trouble for everybody he worked for there. Difficult guys, uh, uh, Koji Katao. Koji Katao, by the way, wrestled at a WrestleMania too. Uh, also, not at WrestleMania too. He wrestled at a WrestleMania also. Uh, I think it was WrestleMania. What was that one? Seven, uh, and uh, with uh, Tenru against Demolition, hmm. Katao and Tenru. But uh, anyway, he was also a Yokozuna. But he's considered one of the biggest mistakes that the committee ever made, and because uh, they promoted a troublemaker to that uh, to that spot, he never won a major tournament. Caused all kinds of issues, got kicked out. So, yeah, uh, there you go. Uh, Ake Bono, not so much. He always carried himself with dignity. He's considered a very successful uh, Yokozuna and basically very popular. And, and as mentioned up here, uh, most of the people that uh, encountered him said he was a really nice guy, uh, that uh, he, he, was a ki- he was kind, handled himself with, uh, with dignity, treated others well, and uh, all around an excellent representative of the title, which probably opened the door for some of these top Mongolian rest born wrestlers to become Yokozuna. Cause I think if the first foreign born Yokozuna turned out to be a failure, it might've been a very long time before we saw another one. It would have been a different pathway of history. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, very influential on sumo uh, and uh, had an impact in new Japan pro wrestling and sadly passed away uh, yesterday. Eight fifty four is way too young to go, man. Way too way young. Too young. I, I'm not quite that age, but it's a nightmare to be dying at that age. My health goes that downhill. Just think about it all the time. We have gone super, 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 super sized yeah. this week. Uh, over two hours. Again, this is the 100th episode. Thank you to everyone who supported us. Shown up for 10 seconds of their time to watch our show. Yeah. Shared guests, fans, everybody. Thank you so much. Yeah. Just a reminder again, we are going to be back tomorrow night. Yep. For a review, a live review of the Windy City Riot being held in Chicago. We will have Josh DeV of We Weren't Stiff. We will be live within an hour of the show ending, and we are going to have opinions. So. <laughs> no. No question about it. And Vankins, I'll see you all tomorrow after Mox and Naito. Yes, I'm glad you're I'm glad you're going to be there. I'm really looking forward to this show and talking to you all about it tomorrow. So with that in mind, anything else, Jeremy, before we wrap this one up? I got nothing. Steven, you are the best partner I could have for the last 100 episodes, and I'm very thankful for you. I'm grateful for the chance to do this with you, buddy. I really, really enjoy this each and every week and uh, just talking to you and uh, talking with all these folks over here. And it's been wonderful. Let's do another 100. Eh, maybe two. <laughs> With that in mind, thanks again for listening. Thank you for watching. Thanks, everybody. And we will be back tomorrow night. So with that in mind, for Jeremy Feinstone, I'm Stephen Conway. We'll talk to you again real soon. Peace out.